Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Sommelier of Cinema, your Archbishop of Banterbury, <laughs> your Chancellor of Cheerfulness, and of course, as we all know, your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett. Robcasting it, you, you Imagination Connoisseurs, you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity, with Rob Observations episode number 400. And 52. You know what that means? That means we're on the downslope to episode 500. 500. I have to outdo myself. I have to outdo myself. I'm going to broadcast for 500 minutes. I've got to do 10 interviews instead of 5 interviews. Got to line up those interviews. Got to start doing them now because, man, it takes a while. You got to edit that stuff. Get it going. 10 interviews. I don't know if I can get 10 interviews, to be honest. Uh, but I got a lot of people. Got a lot of people I've, I've reached out to. We'll see what I can do. We'll see what I can accomplish. You know, you can accomplish quite a bit. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, today, the 25th of June, is a, is a big day for science fiction, fantasy, horror, and imagination connoisseur fans. Or if you're an imagination connoisseur that is a fan of science fiction, fantasy, and horror, today is a big day. Because as you all know, the greatest genre summer, the greatest imagination connoisseur summer of all time was the summer of 1982. There were two Sophie's Choice that summer. There was June 4th. What are you going to go see? You're going to go see Poltergeist? You're going to go see Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan? I mean, for me, there was, it was a no-brainer. I went and saw Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan four times at the John Dance Theater that day. That's right. I saw Wrath of Khan four times. And then I went downtown, downtown Seattle, the next day, and I went and saw Poltergeist in 70mm at the town theater, which is across the street from the Coliseum, where I had seen a couple years previous Flash Gordon, excuse me, Flash Gordon. I'd also seen, oh, I don't know, Roller Coaster and Sense Around there. I saw a lot of movies at the Coliseum. It was a once grand theater, but it was kind of low rent by the time that I was going to movies. But still, it was a fun time. I also saw the David Cronenberg Festival when Scanners opened. I saw, I dragged my friends down. I've talked about this on, before on the show. Um, we saw... They came from within, rabid, the brood, and then they showed scanners, and I had to like beg people in line to get me and my friends in. It was pretty funny. So anyway, the other Sophie's Choice was June 25th. June 25th, ladies and gentlemen. What happened on June 25th? That's right. John Carpenter's The Thing and Blade Runner opened on the same day. And I know exactly where I was that day. It was noon. I was there for the noon show. I went and saw Blade Runner at the Cinerama Theater. The Cinerama, which needs to be saved. So if anybody, if anybody's in Seattle, if you're watching, please save the Cinerama Theater. Tell Paul Allen's company, Vulcan, that while Paul isn't here, he would have wanted it that way. I know, it's a very valuable piece of real estate, but, but don't allow it to be destroyed. It's the greatest theater left in Seattle. Why let it go to waste? Turn it into some kind of a, turn it into some kind of a, a natural, I don't know, historical site. That's what I would do. Anyway, uh, so I went and saw Blade Runner with Jolie Von Sur and my friend Mike Schertz. And neither one of us, we, none of, all three of us, we weren't 17. It was rated R. Sometimes you couldn't get into movies back then. We sent Jolie ahead because, you know, she was a spunky uh, uh, girl. And we figured as a girl, she probably could cajole her way into getting the tickets, which she did. And we went in. They had a special sound presentation for Blade Runner. It was in 70 millimeter. So we went and saw Blade Runner at the very first show upon opening. And I must say, I think we were all rather perplexed. We knew he, we had seen something amazing, but we didn't know if we liked it. Not at first. Just because it was so different from what we were expecting. I mean, come on. Harrison Ford was coming off the one-two punch of The Empire Strikes Back, and a year later, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And now it's a year later after that. And, you know, we'd seen Blade Runner on the cover of Starlog. We thought it was going to be one thing. It turned out to not be what we expected. It was obviously beautiful, and it was awe-inspiring, and the music was amazing, and the sound was earth-shattering. It, it was a true experience at the theater. Um, but I didn't know if I liked it at first. And again, the next day, I went to the Overlake Cinemas, and I saw John Carpenter's The Thing. Now, I was already a dyed-in-the-wool John Carpenter fan. I had seen Escape from New York at the Crossroads Cinema. My dad took us, me and some friends, this was now a year later. Uh, John Carpenter had graduated to the big leagues. This was a universal movie. 
you know, Compass releasing was doing Halloween. Then it was Avco Embassy with the fog and Escape from New York. Now he was in the big leagues. And I got to tell you, man, I love the thing when I saw it. I saw it at the Overlake Cinema. Not the biggest screen. Presentation was eh. Certainly wasn't the Cinerama. But it was amazing. Anyway, loved it. Both movies failed. They were both box office disappointments. Blade Runner, uh, not so much, I think, as The Thing was. People expected great things. Carpenter, was he, was he was a hit machine. Halloween, The Fog, Escape from New York had all done very, very well. Um, but both movies failed. Now, they're coming on the heels mere weeks later, weeks after E.T. had come out. And uh, E.T., a four-quadrant film, I was captivated by E.T. I actually went to a public sneak for E.T. Uh, I don't know if it was a week or two weeks before it opened at the Crossroads Cinema. Uh, where I had seen Escape from New York, and I was blown away. People don't remember, but when E.T. was being made, it was being made in secrecy. No one really knew what it was like or what it was about. Was it a sequel to Close Encounters? They did it pretty pretty fast. I mean, he was coming out a year after Raiders, and, and people just didn't know about it. And it was interesting because also what people don't remember is Poltergeist came out like, a week before E.T., or I saw Poltergeist. I saw E.T. a week after Poltergeist, and it was almost as if you were looking at, it was like Steven Spielberg created, built this giant neighborhood up in the Santa Clarita Valley, and he was going to set a bunch of movies there. You had Poltergeist and E.T., and they just, they seemed to be set in the same suburban neighborhood. So there was a, really, America was really in touch with, I think, both of those movies, and it, it set the tone for the summer. Now, this was also the summer where the Road Warrior, Mad Max 2, the Road Warrior made it to American shores. We had Conan the Barbarian. You had Cat People. You had E.T. You had Poltergeist. You had Tron. You had Rocky 3. I mean, it was it was an incredible summer. Uh, I mean, think about that. In in, th- in two months, Conan, uh, Rocky 3. I, I include Rocky 3 because it was so much damn fun. But you had... All of these movies, Poltergeist, Star Trek II, Blade Runner, Road Warrior, Tron. I mean, it was like every time you went to the theater to be an imagination connoisseur, it was amazing. It was amazing. But both Tron and, I mean, well, Tron too. Tron was not the success that they wanted, but there, there were other reasons for that. Um, but Blade Runner and The Thing, which opened on the same day, both, they bombed. They bombed. Now, I, should, I would be remiss if I did not plug something right now. No, nope, not what you think I'm going to plug. I contributed an essay to this book, The Cyberpunk Nexus, which you can get on Amazon. I think you can download it for Kindle. Um, it's a very cool book that examines the, the entirety of the Blade Runner sort of universe. It even talks about K.W. Jeter's sequel books, comic adaptations. And I wrote an essay in this book called Awe, Wonder, and Disappointment. Blade Runner on the box office of the summer of 1982. So, if I may, I, I would highly recommend if you're a Blade Runner fan, picking this book up because it's a it's a very very cool book. I know it's self serving to promote my own shit on my channel, but if, if I don't do it, who will? This book came out uh, I think like two years ago, year and a half ago, two years ago. Uh, I would say check it out because the essay I wrote directly deals with this. But you know what else deals with this? Let me tell you what else deals with this: an article. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, an article that was in Esquire today. So I figured, why not share it? Uh, This this was written by Chris Nashawadi. Nashawadi? It's either Nashawadi or Nashawadi, maybe Nashawadi. 38 years ago today, two of the best sci-fi films of all time bombed in theaters. What happened? Let's find out. Film critics get it wrong all the time. But even so, I can't imagine that the profession has ever had a worse day on the job than June 25th, 1982. If you're a rabid sci-fi nerd, guilty as charged, today marks a special sort of anniversary. One that remains as bittersweet as it is utterly confounding. After all, it was on this day 38 summers ago that two indisputable classics, directed by two unassailable masters, were released in theaters only to be met by critical venom and relative indifference from ticket buyers. I'm talking, of course, about Ridley Scott's visionary Future Shock brain teaser Blade Runner and John Carpenter's gooey masterclass in Sub-Zero Paranoia, The Thing. First, 
a little backstory. It's tempting to look back with the benefit of hindsight and wonder how two movies that targeted the exact same demographic could have been scheduled to open on the same weekend. Why weren't they spaced out a little? Today, of course, there are armies of highly paid statisticians who crunch tons of numbers to circumvent that exact problem. But the movie business was a different beast in 1982. It also turned out to be a ridiculously loaded boom year for science fiction movies, an embarrassment of galactic riches. In addition to Blade Runner and The Thing, 1982 also gave us Poltergeist, Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior, Tron, Star Trek 2 The Wrath of Khan, Conan the Barbarian, and Steven Spielberg's 800-pound box office gorilla, E.T. The Extraterrestrial, all within the same barely ajar 10-week summer window. But still, why not spread the wealth around a little? Well, as with just about all things, you can pin the blame on Star Wars. After all, both 1977's A New Hope and the 1980's The Empire Strikes Back opened in May. If you worked at a major studio in 1982, the new box office conventional wisdom dictated that sci-fi geeks came out in hordes when air conditioning was on the menu. It wasn't just a slew of competition that doomed these two films that are now regarded as integral pieces of sci-fi canon. Both, in their own ways, had ominously rocky roads to the big screen. Let's start with Blade Runner. After establishing his genre bona fides with 1979's Alien, Ridley Scott had no shortage of options for his follow-up film. But by the time that he signed on for his adaptation of Philip K. Dick's Thicker <laughs> Thickerty 1989 novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, the unseemingly unfilmable project had been bounced around for years. At one point, Martin Scorsese was flirting with directing it, but Dick, a tough customer if ever there was one, raged at every single script he'd seen. Then, Hampton Fancher, the credited writer of the version we now know, finally cracked it, or came close enough, in 1977. And in a fortuitous confluence of events, it fell into Scott's hands just after he walked away from directing an adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune. That's right, which would become even more reviled celluloid disaster helmed by David Lynch in 1984. With its endless false starts and ever-escalating development budget, Blade Runner's initial backers, Filmways, seemed all too happy to withdraw from the project and sold it to the Ladd Company. Principal photography began on March 9, 1981. As has been well reported, Scott and his leading man, Harrison Ford, clashed mightily. And when test audiences complained about the film's Byzantine plot about a futuristic gumshoe hunting rogue replicants in a dystopian future, Scott caved to studio pressure and called Ford back in to record a noirish bit of voiceover narration that the actor hated. When we started shooting, it had been tacitly agreed that the version of the film that we agreed upon was the version without voiceover narration, Ford groused in, in a 1992 interview. It was a fucking nightmare. I thought that the film had worked without the narration. I went kicking and screaming into the studio to record it. This will be no surprise to anyone who's ever listened to Ford's sleepy, can't-be-bothered monotone in the theatrical cut of Blade Runner. Meanwhile, look at that, McCready. Come on, Kurt Russell, he's the man. Meanwhile, in the opposing corner, there was The Thing. By 1982, it was hard to imagine a director on a hotter winning streak than John Carpenter. Beginning with 1976's low-budget and white-knuckle-tense siege flick Assault on Precinct 13, he'd prodigi prodigiously cranked out Halloween, The Fog, and Escape from New York, not to mention the TV movie Someone's Watching Me and Elvis, at a caffeinated rat-a-tat clip. Adapted from John W. Campbell's chilling 1938 novella, Who Goes There?, the thing had been turned into a movie once before, and a damned fine one. Christian Nyby and Howard Hawke's 1951 Cold War-era allegory, The Thing from Another World. Carpenter was such a fan of Hawke's, and of that movie in particular, that eagle-eyed viewers of Halloween will recall Nyby and Hawke's film playing on TV in the background as masked maniac Michael Myers comes for Jamie Lee Curtis, Curtis's babysitter Laurie Strode. It was a movie lover's nod to one of his heroes that would, in time, <clears throat> take on the feeling of prophecy. Universal approached Carpenter to direct the thing first, but the director couldn't fathom how he could possibly make a version that improved on Hawks. After the studio's second choice, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre's Toby Hooper parted ways with Universal, the studio hated his script, the project was dumped into development purgatory. Ironically, it was after only the success of Ridley Scott's Alien that the studio pulled it out of mothballs and went back to Carpenter for a second time. This time, they got their man, who tapped his Escape from New York star Kurt Russell to head up an ensemble cast of Antarctic researchers whose base camp is invaded by an insidious body-snatching alien with a sweet tooth for splattery, stomach-churning gore courtesy of wonderkind makeup FX maestro Rob Bottin. Like Blade Runner, the thing was meant to be ambiguous, forcing Carpenter to shoot multiple endings. 
As the summer of 1982 approached, both Blade Runner and The Thing weren't even a blip on the public's radar. All anyone could talk about was Spielberg's cute and cuddly Reese's Pieces loving alien. Yes, moviegoers wanted to see science fiction films, just not the kind that came with unhappy endings and more thorny questions than feel-good answers. E.T. opened on June 11, 1982 to, uh, to $11.8 million and would spend 16 weeks at number one. It would also grow, end up grossing $435 million domestically and another $358 million abroad as gravy. Coming just two short weeks later, both Scott and Carpenter never stood a chance. The first wave of bad news for Blade Runner came when the nation's critics finally laid eyes on the film and rushed back to their typewriters to render their verdicts, only stopping on the way to sharpen their shivs. Of the two films, Blade Runner fared, fared slightly better. Still, the Los Angeles Times said that Scott's film was so slow they called it Blade Crawler. Variety, for its part, complained about Blade Runner's unrelenting grimness. The dean of American film criticism, Pauline Kael, argued that Scott seems to be trapped in his own alleyways without a map. And while Roger Ebert admitted that the film looks sensational, he summed it up by saying it was a failure as a story. Ouch. Ouch. Essentially dismissed as a $28 million art film, Blade Runner would eke out just $26 million at the box office by the time all was said and done, putting it well outside the year's top 20 grossing films. It ended up as number 29, uncomfortably shoehorned between Victor Victoria and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Adding insult to injury, its mastermind, Philip K. Dick, would pass away from a heart attack three months before the film opened. He was spared the scathing reviews, but also its eventual elevation into one of sci-fi's sacred texts. As for the thing, the nation's critics didn't even bother to qualify their pans with the occasional compliment. They were too thirsty for blood. In the New York Times, Vincent Canby wrote, John Carpenter's The Thing is a foolish, depressing, overproduced movie that mixes horror with science fiction and makes something that is fun as neither one thing or the other. It qualifies only as instant junk. Whew. Ebert again called it a barf bag movie, a geek show, a gross out movie in which teenagers can dare one another to watch the screen. Even Cinefantastique, a zine published by and for the precise audience that Carpenter was courting, ran a cover story posing the friendly fire question, is this the most hated movie of all time? The Thing would open in eighth place, eighth place in its first weekend before limping its way to a total of $19 million at the box office by the merciful end of its theatrical run. Meanwhile, Universal, who had seduced Carpenter to helm the film by signing him to a fat multi-picture deal, pulled the plug on his contract and sent him packing. The failure of the thing would rattle Carpenter's confidence for years to come. It was his first flop, and it stung. I lost lots of jobs because of the thing, Carpenter told Empire Magazine in 2017. The reaction was extremely tough to take. My career would have been different had it been financially successful. So how did the critical and public consensus on these two movies change? The answer is fairly simple. Home video. As Blade Runner and The Thing vanished from theaters, they found second lives in the rec rooms and basements of the very people who had steered clear of them in theaters. There, you could watch and re-watch these films and dissect them like sci-fi versions of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The initial damning verdict would end up doing 180 over time, in some cases inspiring young VHS-obsessed film buffs to become future directors themselves, directors who championed and proselytized for those once-dismissed masterpieces. In the case of Blade Runner, Scott's film also had the added benefit of being re-released in 1992 in a director's cut version that 86th Ford's voiceover narration added a crucial unicorn dream sequence and scrapped the film's happy ending, leading to a wave of re-evaluation. Today, Scott and Carpenter's box office misfires are evidence of a second, and more hard-won, path to classic film status. Yes, some movies are anointed on delivery, but others, like these twin failures, quote, in quotes, from the summer of 1982 take a longer and more winding path to the Pantheon. These movies need time to marinate and lodge themselves in the public consciousness. They are of their time, but also ahead of their time, patiently waiting for their moment to finally arrive. The waiting can be endless and painful, and it may never come, but if and when it does, their vindication in the appeals court of film history can be sweeter than if they were accepted right from start uh, I could not agree more with that uh, essay I thought it was really nice and I love that Esquire magazine or the Esquire website dropped it today I'm like well I gotta talk about that 
You know, it's it's funny every time I think, well, there's going to be nothing to talk about today because there's really no entertainment news. And I do scour the entertainment news. I mean, there's entertainment news, but nothing of particular interest to this group, to our group, to us. But I thought it was always fun to go back and it's always fun to go back and reevaluate these things. And, you know, like one of the the interesting things, I brought this up on the show before, when the thing came out on Universal Home Entertainment, and actually it was MCA, MCA Home Video, it was expensive. It was one of those VHS tapes that was expensive, but I bought that tape. I, I went out and I, it was like 70 bucks. And, you know, back then I was working in home video, so I got it for cost, but it was still... It was still expensive, but one of the interesting things, uh, when when Nalls is uh, the the, the um, is it Nalls? I think it's Nalls. He's the cook, and uh, he says, "Who put their dirty drawers in my kitchen trash can?" Um, he's playing Stevie Wonder's Superstition, and it was one of the first times. Actually, there were two big movies that came out from MCA. It was Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and The Thing. That were two films that I had acquired. And they had music changed for their home video release. They didn't get the rights, the home video rights for Superstition. So when the thing first was released on video uh, cassette, it didn't have that song in it. And it was so irksome to get. Like, I'm like, what? what? I mean, that doesn't happen anymore. But a lot of times, because home video was new, nobody expected home video to do what it did. So when they were negotiating contracts, like one of the things people don't really understand is if you want to put pre-existing music in your movie like you want to get what's called a source cue a source cue is anything that like a source cue would be a piece of music that you're acquiring like if you want a piece of pop music and use it in your movie like what quentin quentin tarantino does you have to go acquire that music you have to get the rights so you have to get um the publishing you have to pay for publishing and you have to pay for the performance unless you want to re-record it and it can be expensive and so back in the early days of home video, there was a lot of modern movies that didn't do that and TV shows. Like if you're a fan of Stephen Canal's Wise Guy, which I am, there's a whole arc about a record company where Vinny Terranova goes undercover at, at uh, Dead Dog Records. Glenn Fry is in that and uh, it, Patty Darbinville's in that. And it's a great arc, but it's never been released on home video, even to this day, because well, they don't have the video rights, and because it's Wise Guy, it's not exactly going to be something they're going to sell millions of copies of. They're not going to spend the money, so that arc might be lost forever. Although I've heard, obviously, Scream or Shout Factory is acquiring it to broadcast, so maybe cooler heads have prevailed or somebody paid for that material, but who knows. Same was true of Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Um, the music, I believe the song Fast Times at Ridgemont High isn't in the movie. I don't know if it is now, but it wasn't during the first home video release. And that was true of the thing. And then, of course, the first release of Blade Runner that came out was on Embassy Home Entertainment. It wasn't even on Warner Home Video. It was on Embassy. And um, they they had added, it was like the European cut. And they touted the fact that there's extra violence. And you see, like, when Roy Batty's fingers go into Terrell's eyeballs, there was more of that, more violence. And of course, I had to buy that, too. And when that came out, when Blade Runner had come out, What's really interesting also about the summer of uh, 1982 is there was a fundamental shift that was happening in home video at that time. And uh, Paramount sort of led the way by putting out movies to sell. And the first movie, when they say to sell, they were going to be $39.95. Normally, movies were really for rent. If you wanted to buy them, they were $50, $60, $70. Like the Blues Brothers was $112 when it first came out on VHS. And it came out in two cassettes because it was so long. So uh, Star Trek II and Officer and a Gentleman were the first sell-through titles that a, a home entertainment company put out, and they were, they were priced to sell at $39.95. And Blade Runner followed soon after, and it was also priced to sell at $39.95. And so that was sort of, you know, interesting. But, um, yeah, like the article pointed out, I mean, both of these films have become so revered, and it, 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 it's always struck me like... It, sometimes it's really all about what the movie going audience has been conditioned to understand or view. And I, I would say that, like, if you look at the current state of superhero movies, for instance, yes, we had Superman the movie in 80 uh, and 78. We had Tim Burton's Batman just celebrating its 31st anniversary in 89. And then there were sort of one offs like Blade or The Crow in the 90s. 
But the idea that comic book movies could suddenly become something other than one-offs, that they would become so some of the most beloved movies of all time. I mean, Batman and Superman were, of course, but it was because audiences didn't yet understand them. And, and what's interesting is, obviously, because of Star Wars, Star Wars killed a certain kind of science fiction film that had been coming out up through 1977. And basically, there was a golden age of science fiction, really, from the late 60s to Star Wars. But it was pretty dour and dystopian. I mean, even 2001 is fairly dystopian, if you really think about it. You, you had Planet of the Apes that went full-on end of the world in its second film, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. You know, you had Quatermass in the Pit, which came out in 67. And then all through the 70s, you had things like A Boy and His Dog and Soylent Green and The Omega Man and the rest of the Apes trilogy. Uh, uh, quintet? Quintet? Right? Is that five? Would you call it a quintrilogy? What's five movies called? I don't know. A quintrilogy? Uh, but it, it was... Um, they were pretty dour. Even Logan's Run, very dystopian. And that came out a year before Star Wars. But when Star Wars came out, science fiction suddenly became space fantasy and it was all happy-go-lucky. I mean, sure, Alien came out and revolutionized the horror science fiction genre. But Alien really was a horror film set in space more so than a science fiction film, even though I would dare say that the Xenomorph is one of the great science fiction creatures uh, things aliens ever portrayed on screen. I think to this day it probably is the gold standard. I know some people are going to say, well, the Predators, you know, was a little cooler. Well, maybe, but in terms of an alien life form with its life cycle, I don't think the alien has been surpassed. And then, of course, we had to live through every alien semi ripoff like Creature and Galaxy of Terror and uh, every other thing, e Extra, whatever, you name it. We had to sit through it. But um, the home video era. And the cable, it wasn't just home video, it was the rise of cable too. So you would watch these movies, you'd acquire movies, and you'd watch them over and over and over again. Because you could. And I think that's when, when people, these, these movies became, if you liked sci-fi horror, and, and once it was removed from public opinion, once you could actually sit down without expectations or without, I want more E.T. or I want more Poltergeist, you could watch these things over and over again and like the article said they would marinate and they became a part of you and you know everybody could say i've seen things you people wouldn't believe i've seen you know attack ships on fire off the shoulder of orion who doesn't know that speech everybody knows that speech everybody can recite it verbatim and uh that's because of home video and it really it sort of changed and, and then what was even more interesting is home video and cable was was completely responsible for terminator 2 Judgment Day, because Terminator, while it was a very well-regarded movie at the time, it was such a huge hit on home video, and everyone loved it, that James Cameron could be like, let's make a sequel, and oh, by the way, it's going to be the first $100 million movie ever made, and it's got to come out in like 10 months. Oh, okay. Here's a check, Jim. I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a time when home video, a lot of the time, would rescue movies, home video and cable, and that went on for a long time. I mean, that really went on all the way up through the rise of streaming until about 10 years ago when things started to really change. I mean, certainly DVD even bolstered movies even further. Um, and while I love Blade Runner 2049, I think it's one of the best sequels ever made, it still baffles me why they expected it to make money for 170 million bucks. I mean, maybe $70 million, but to, to follow Blade Runner, always very interesting. But, I mean, what do you guys think? How do you feel about Blade Runner and the thing? Do you still love them? Anyway, uh, I wanted to celebrate those, those films today, and uh, I've always loved them. And I've got let man, I got so many letters. I got some good, you guys, girls, gentle beings, kind folks from across the 28 known galaxies. My God, do you never, ever, ever disappoint me. And um, I have a special letter today from Claude, one half of the, the official couple of the Post Geek Singularity of Raw Observations of the Burnett work, Claude and Candida. Uh, Claude has written me a very interesting letter that was inspired by Gone Girl. The speech about cool girls in Gone Girl, I think, caused him to write this. And I'm going to share it with you. Bonjour, Monsieur Robert. Owatu, the watcher of the Post Geek Singularity. The cool kids and 
the haters. Who are the cool kids? In this analogy, it's based on our perception of their aspiration. They're the adults we perceive to be doing better than us. They're the people we like. They tend to be better looking, funnier, and smarter than most. They tend to be witty without being condescending or boorish. Within the post-geek singularity, they know the difference between the Space 1999 Eagle Transporter and the Rebel X-Wing. They're also self-effacing and empathetic when they need to be. Like a comedian or actor, they're playing the crowd. Now keep in mind the cool kids may be from other ethnic backgrounds to include African, Asian, and Latino. The cool kids could look like the X-Men or the Teen Titans. Chances are the cool kid comes from a middle to upper class background, but not necessarily because anyone can do cool stuff. Cool kids can enjoy anime, comic books, and the MCU just as much as skiing, golf, and sailing. The artsy, cool adult couples watch films with subtitles. They go to film festivals and have Indian and Thai for dinner. They can mix the latest cocktails and love to spend time at the local vineyard. And yes, they've probably already traveled to the places that you want to go to. Adult cool kids are not social climbers. They are, however, invited to parties because people want to see them and be around them. They're charismatic masters of the humble brag. Skiing in Aspen? Not this weekend. Just managed to get in some snowshoeing after volunteering at the local shelter. Oh, it's only a doctorate or a BFA in sculpture. The cool kids have opinions, but they're not haters. They're actually supportive and respectful of others. What is important to note, the cool kids do not have a sordid fascination with race relations. That's because they don't define their self-worth in those terms. They're the new cool. Some of you are thinking, I do some of those things. Of course you do, but let's examine what the cool kids are not. Haters. Who are the haters? In this analogy, the haters are individuals with a bone to pick with all the other groups. They criticize the cool kids for being too advantaged and too mainstream. They criticize the normies for being sheep. They're always outraged that someone else is outraged. The haters are very serious about one cause or another. They are preoccupied with one grievance after another. Haters love to hate partisan politics, but they spend all of their time watching partisan news. The haters love to discuss race. In this analogy, haters are liberals as well as conservatives, and they all think they're doing the right thing. Haters are preoccupied with the differences in groups. Instead of building bridges by focusing on common ground, they focus on the disagreements. For many, their egos tend to be built on tribal affiliations. They draw pride from national or ethnic achievements. My people did that, even though they've personally done nothing. In contrast, the cool kids are aspirational and define themselves by what they do. They learn to sail a boat by hanging out with sailors. They ski double black diamonds during years spent on the mountains listening to Bob Marley. <laughs> That's actually true. <laughs> they volunteered for Doctors Without Borders and learned Swahili during their time in the Congo. They can drop three-pointers with flair after spending countless hours in the gym. They can also quote Shakespeare and Chaucer, because that's what they're into. They're actually into other people. Where haters are obsessed with themselves and their own insecurities. Okay, these are broad generalizations, but keep in mind, we can choose to be in one group or the other. It's our choice. Do you want to be aspirational or disgruntled? If there is one thread that we can pull from the sordid mess we find ourselves in, is that we are a world of individuals. Our sex, skin tone, nationalities, and ethnicities help to shape us, but do not define us. The cool kids provide us with an aspirational goal for the future. Like the crews of Star Trek Enterprise, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager, we can choose to be defined by our actions and not our cultural affiliations. Rob, I think you're a cool kid. Man, I was worried about that. As are, I didn't know where this was going. <laughs> I think you're a, kid, a cool kid, as are many in the post-geek singularity. That's what makes you uniquely skilled to do what you do every day. Keep up the good work. Thanks for reading my letter. Excelsior, Claudius. Uh, I like that letter. And not just because of where you took it. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I think it's important. I would like to think that, like you pointed out, uh, Claude, I'd like to think that everybody here, most of the people that watch this channel, are that way. Uh, certainly that's been my experience dealing with all of you for the last year and a half that we've been on this journey together. And uh, 
I thank my lucky stars every day that you are on this journey with me. And I keep getting more and more letters from people that feel that way. You know, I, I it never, um, when I started doing this, I, I, I didn't know, as I've said before, I didn't know what this channel was supposed to be. You know, it was, it was John Schnepp who first told me, you know, Rob, you, you got this good vibe. You should do your own show. And then I was doing this show with John Campion. And he kind of alluded to it, like, start your own show. John's, John's a big proponent of people starting their own shows and, and sharing of themselves. And, of course, Elizabeth really, uh, she bought me this Yeti microphone. So um, that was when I figured, okay, now I have to do this show. But it's been interesting watching it develop um, and watching it develop over the last the, the course of this year because that's what I've been uh, trying to do is is uh, create an aspirational environment. And I guess it's been working because, well, you'll see. Uh, I have many letters to read. And this first one comes from our man Calvin Bowes. Uh, Dear Rob, I'm very saddened by what is happening in our culture today. I believe that now people are not just trying to be culturally sensitive, but instead they want to throw the archives of peop- uh, archives, archives, and peoples of the past just to tear them down. I have recent examples. We have Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon both accused of doing blackface. Before I go on, let's first look at what blackface is and what it is not. Blackface is when you paint your face black and do the big white lips for the purpose of mocking African Americans. It's not just putting on dark makeup, so anyone who played a Klingon on Star Trek might be guilty of this. Let's look at first what Jimmy Kimmel did. He was on the TV show The Man Show, which was supposed to be a politically incorrect program and imitated a basketball player, Carl Malone. He darkened his skin to make himself look like the ball player. He was imitating one person and not mocking an entire race. Let's look at Jimmy Fallon. He impersonated his friend Chris Rock. He darkened his skin to look more like Chris Rock. He was not mocking an entire race. By the way, Chris Rock found it hilarious. On Saturday Night Live, people impersonate famous people all the time. Norm MacDonald played Bob Dole holding a pencil in his right hand as Bob Dole did nothing because his right hand was paralyzed. Was he making fun of disabled people? No, he was just trying to do an accurate impersonation. The people that we're talking about are actors who play roles and people they are not. Let's also look at who the attackers are that are going after them and who they are not. When Jimmy Fallon did his impersonation of Chris Rock on an SNL show on NBC, that is current show The Tonight Show is on, no one is going after the executives who had to approve the sketch for it to go on the air. What about Lauren Michaels, who produced the show? He had to approve it, as he had the final say on what sketches are cut before broadcast. What angers me about all this stuff is I believe this is about nothing more than let's look into someone's past just to find garbage that we can expose on successful people so we can bring them down. Think about if I did an imitation of a famous actor who had a big nose, and I put on a big nose, and I'm making fun of people with large noses. No, I'm trying to recreate the actor as best I can. What is next is, are we going to go after Billy Crystal because he imitated Muhammad Ali doing his voice and facial expressions? How about Tina Fey and Kristen Wiig doing Bill Cosby's voice? What about if an actor wears dress-up if he's going to be shot down for making fun of trans people? When does it stop? And also, why go back so far in someone's past and both things happen with Kimmel and Fallon are over 20 years old. Why are we doing this if it is truly to make the world a better place? Or have we become nothing more than garbage collectors? Well, Calvin, uh, a good point you make, sir. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, I think, I think again, it's, it's intent. You know, even if you kill somebody in the United States, our justice system, there's uh, first degree, second degree, third degree murder. There's manslaughter. There's different degrees of what people are trying to do. And uh, I agree. Minstrel shows and all of that was was terrible. You know, you're making fun of it was done. It's the same. Look, as a Jew, I, I've seen many people play Jews. Uh, big noses and the, the standard stereotypes. I've seen it a lot in my life. Um, and the thing is, some of the time, there's a lot of truth to these kinds of impressions. It really depends how it's done. Billy Crystal, for instance, was great friends with Muhammad Ali. Billy Crystal loved Muhammad Ali. Um, if you've ever seen him speak about Muhammad Ali, you would you would absolutely know that. And I don't think there was any... So if anybody ever went after Billy Crystal, that would be a big mistake. Just like Carl Malone. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of love there. 
And so I think you're absolutely right. I think nowadays it's so weird to me that there's now groups of people that really have their knives sharpened and they're like, hey, 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 who can we go after and destroy today? And my question would be, like the cool kids letter that Claude wrote, why are we doing this? Is this making the world a better place? If you're exposing somebody who worked in comedy, I mean, you no one's going to go after the Way Wayans brothers for making white chicks. Um, I mean, maybe they should, but not for the reasons, certainly not for dressing up as white people. <laughs> maybe the movie itself. But it's a, very, it's a very weird time we live in. And the real question is, why? Why are we doing this? Why do people feel emboldened now to go after other people? I mean, Jimmy Kimmel is certainly an ally. And Jimmy Kimmel has been doing a lot of, uh, of great work, especially when it comes to bringing awareness to health care. He had, a, he had a, a, his own health scare, his son did. I mean, these are people that are, well, for the most part, I don't know about their private lives, but hey, they might be famous, but they're, Jimmy Kimmel's a family man. You know, is it important to go after him? I mean, was he really, is he racist? I think not. So it's a very good, it's, it's something that you bring up. I mean, everybody's, and by the way, why is everybody so holier than thou now? My God, as if everybody, I'm perfect, so I'm going to go after everyone else. I don't understand it. Uh, again, if people would concentrate more on their selves, making themselves better, that's how you make the world a better place. Um, this comes from Mosin Nuri. Mosin Nuri. I hope you got your, your name right, Mosin. I think I got it right. Um, also, he's Tangerine Star 26, which is his Google name. Dear Robert and the Post Geek Singularity community, thank you very much for all you do to bring and encourage intelligent conversation around all things geek worthy, as well as to promote respect and understanding. Uh, oh, whilst I have a damn lot of fun as well. Indeed, now more than ever, we are in great need of all of these. I live in continual hope that we will one day reach out and call ourselves one human race. Me too, man. I'm a performer and a creator who has worked in theater, film, and television now for 20 years, and I'm immensely proud of all the stories that I've had the privilege to tell alongside amongst the best in the industry. As such, I greatly welcome your efforts to highlight the grave situation that the creative industry is currently in as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. That means a lot to me as I'm not always convinced that the average person will truly appreciate what happens behind the scenes or indeed who it is that does it. Here in the United Kingdom, as I'm sure for the United States, the creative industry represents a more than significant presence. However, it has in the most part now been shut down since February. Very briefly, there is little prospect of theaters opening in any viable way this year and thus are in the gravest of peril. There is hope for film production to start rolling by the summer, but new guidelines will likely mean vastly reduced casts and crews. Meanwhile, TV production has been, by and large, continued, but at an adaptive stop-start pace. The UK's creative industry supports over 2 million jobs and has contributed well over uh, $111.7 billion in 2018 to the economy, vastly outpacing the Premier League, for example. It also occupies an essential part of the community, with most local theaters, for example, being also centers for learning and social hubs. However, the grave lack of effective support for or understanding of this industry thus far demonstrated by our government has deeply shocked everyone concerned about the industry's future. See how we've all sought refuge in films, books, music, games, TV, and streaming to get us through this horrible time? Well, that's thanks to us. So are we now but the bread and the circus? The creative industry is about more than just buildings and institutions. It's about the people who bring them to life. Artists, puppeteers, performers, technicians, animators, administrators, choreographers, drivers, managers, singers, directors, designers, makers, musicians, writers, composers, educators, dancers, producers, to name but a few. Working in theater, film, online, television, radio, digital gaming, publishing, advertising, live music venues, sound recording studios. And then there is the support chain, a huge myriad of small and medium businesses who supply goods, materials, and services. I think you get the idea. The vast majority of us have had no income since February and will continue to have no income for the foreseeable future. The vast majority of us are self-employed freelancers. Why, yes, we are. As you well know, the creative arts sector's impact on the economy and society reaches far, reaches wide, and it reaches deep. We entertain you. We make you think. 
We transport you, we teach you, we bring you together. This is our moment of dire need. There are no two ways about it. Many parts of the UK's creative industry are on the very brink of collapse unless decisive action is taken to save this vital pillar of our economy and society. And the same is undoubtedly happening in the US and everywhere else where there is a story to tell. We need to give more than just applause and lip service to the arts and instead must invest for the very long term by addressing the chronic problems that we suffer. This has to be the way forward. Band-aids are not a remedy for a gaping wound. If there is no significant root and branch support beyond the summer, then all of this, all that you enjoy, will be in dire jeopardy. A great many people will be forced to leave a profession which they have dedicated their vocational lives to. And an entire industry will lose such breadth and depth of skill and talent which cannot be recovered from for generations to come. This must therefore be a call to arms. In the UK, as in the US and across the world, we must seek out alliances with those who can advocate for the creative industry to find ways of working together to save this vital sector. If you want to continue enjoying the vast great media that you do, then now is the time to support the creative industry. I would urge each and every one of you to write, tweet, share, post, like, create your support for the arts, demand support for the creative industry, including to petition your representatives to do more. I hope that we can continue to count on each and every one of you, as you have been counting on us, to support the arts and its artists through this current crisis and beyond. Perhaps there are those here who are also similarly engaged in the creative industry from anywhere in the world who would like to share their own experiences during this time. How we treat art and its artists today will be viewed as a testament on our very society for ages to come. Many thanks once again we will get through this. Live long and prosper. Tangerine Star-26. What a great letter. Uh, again, this is why I do this show. This is why I love reading your letters because I get this kind of discourse. Um, I agree with everything you said. It's tough out there. I mean, now we're so focused on whether movies are going to come back. But, you know, in Los Angeles County, our COVID rates have skyrocketed. It's as if we didn't shelter at home at all. And it goes to show you, I mean, I know that we had to open the economy. I know that people have been out of work. But uh, if the rates keep skyrocketing the way they are here in Los Angeles County, we're not going to have a lot of people getting back to work anytime soon, especially in production, which is a damn shame. So uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Great letter. Please write more. Please send in more. Uh, this comes from Stephen H. Stephen H. says, Hi, Rob. I was recently given a free week of Shudder through Sling TV. A film I'd been wanting to watch was Coralie uh, Farge's Revenge, and it was bloody awesome. It is bloody awesome. Dating back to my childhood, I've been drawn to horror thrillers. Even more so, female-driven horror thrillers. Yet as a kid, I never really paid attention to the thought of female lead horror films or any type of film. Maybe I was just naive or too young to realize the political landscape. Having grown up on 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street, still my favorite horror movie of all time, it was led with Heather Langenkamp's Nancy Thompson. My favorite television show is still Buffy the Vampire Slayer and obviously led by Sarah Michelle Gellar. From Firefly Serenity's River Tam to Aliens Ripley's and uh, Ripley's from Aliens... R from Firefly Serenity's River Tam to Aliens Ripley and many others, it wasn't until I got older that I saw the backlash from some on the notion or the idea of the female being the hero, and it was dumbfounding. For one reason or another, I've been drawn to strong female leads. In the era of the Me Too mo movement and more inclusion of diverse leads from not just gender, but race and others, it seems that every film is subject to this process. Uh, I'd imagine... Coralie uh, Farge, I think it's Farge, uh, had the idea in mind for a badass female lead as it plays into the story. To see a woman come back from the grip of death to extract revenge could be compared to, say, the crow. One led with a female and the other a male. What if it was Shelley that brought back instead of what if it was Shelley that was brought back instead of Eric Draven? Either way, both amazing films in my book. But let's say A Nightmare on Elm Street was written by Wes Craven with a male lead. Would it be remembered any differently? I always looked at Nancy as someone who fought her fears and overcame. 
that is something that people from any gender, race, religion, and or background could and should relate to. P.S. Buffy deserves a better Blu-ray treatment. Stephen H., Shivering Melody. Well, you know what, Stephen? I mean, you said it. What's really interesting, I think, about the slasher genre and the horror genre, especially in what we saw in the late 70s and early 80s, is that, you know, as Dario Argento once said, and he caught hell for it, you know, if somebody asked him if he, why did he murder all these beautiful women in his movies? And he said, something to the effect of, well, why would I want to murder ugly women? <laughs> and of course, everybody got really pissed at him. But I think it's, it's the, the, the trope of the damsel in distress finding the wherewithal to dispatch her stalker is inherently more interesting than a dude doing it. You know, and I think that one of the great things, the whole the whole idea of the final girl, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, whether she was in Terror Train or Halloween or what was she in Prom Night, all the other movies that she was in, um, you know, as the final girl or whatever, the woman that prevailed, watching a guy do it, eh, that's expected. But watching a strong female prevail over the great evil, even as the men drop like flies around her, that's far more interesting. I mean, obviously in Alien, we saw Sigourney Weaver. She was the only one. She knew what was up. No one else listened to her. You know, they weren't really paying attention. She was also the one going by the book. Of course, she didn't realize that she was fighting the very company she was working for in the shape of Ash. He's a goddamn robot. But I think that horror films with strong female protagonists are, in a sense, inherently more interesting, or they can be. I think one of the greatest horror films of the last two decades is Neil Marshall's Descent. Uh, the Descent. If you haven't seen The Descent, my God, what are you waiting for? But I agree with you. I like this letter, Stephen H. Um, and I think you are correct. Uh, David Anderson is here. Dear Rob, despite your comforting and reassuring broadcasts from the Rob Observatory, these are disturbing and depressing times we live in, especially, it seems, in the United States. Global epidemics, riots, and toxic political climate that really seems to divide and hurt people more than ever, ruining many relationships between strangers, acquaintances, friends, and even families. I take the above quote-unquote more than ever back. Explanation follows. I am a 41-year-old Danish guy. I've lived several years in Nigeria, Spain, and Egypt. I was in the infantry and navy for 15 years. I did several infantry tours in Yugoslavia and Afghanistan. I am an educated school teacher of history, social science, economics, sociology, and politics, and Danish. Now I work in a special prison, guarding, helping, and supporting mentally and socially challenged prisoners, most of them convicted killers and murderers, and I love my job. Nevertheless, I regard myself as well-informed, objective, and a reasonable person. I learned a long time ago, something you also mentioned on Rob's observations, that the world has never been a better place to live in. There has never been more peace, wealth, and well-being in the world than now. Therefore, the claim of more than ever bad times is, of course, not true. A second thing that I've learned is that all throughout history, people have thought and stated that they lived in the most important, significant, and game-changing period of all time. And, of course, they didn't. Now, we all know that we, the people of 2020, live in the most important time of all history. Wink, wink. Get to the point, David. He writes that. He has parenthetically here. Get to the point, David. <laughs> I am a person of my time, my upbringing, my job, my society, with a good dose of Hollywood influence. But I feel that some of the stuff that I have learned to cherish, stuff that made me into the person I am today, is in danger of getting destroyed by present-day, judgmental, politically correct, agenda-driven, and book-burning activists. These activists are seemingly so loud that they scare and influence even Hollywood. Sadly, the same people seem to have no real love or knowledge of the stuff that they destroy. I am, of course, talking about the destruction of American TV and movie culture from the 80s, the 90s, and the aughts. All my life, I've been a fanboy. I love sci-fi, action, adventure, comedy, and humor, heroes and villains, epic journeys in fantastic and or historical settings. My all-time favorite franchises are Star Wars, Star Trek, Aliens, Predator, Terminator, Rambo, Indiana Jones, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Pirates of the Caribbean, etc. 
Of course, I also love many TV series and standalone movies of the same era, ranging from Starship Troopers, Judge Dredd and Commando, to Spaceballs, Willow, and the David Bowie movie Labyrinth. Taking an objective look at my preferences, it's clear that I like stories about good versus evil and heroes versus villains. There's a lot of glorified violence and killing off baddies with no remorse, evil aliens, crooks, terrorists, corrupt cops, and politicians, sometimes even killing them off with a joke or a laugh. Just think of Arnold as John Matrix in the movie Commando, who throws the little sleazy gangster named Sully off a cliff. He cried something like, But you told me you would spare me. I think he says, Kill me last. I lied. Laugh out loud. This brings me to my question. Star Trek has gone off the rails, with Gene Roddenberry spinning in his grave. Star Wars is in ruins, with The Mandalorian and Jon Favreau being our last hope. The newest Alien, Predator, and Terminator movies are like nails in the coffins of the old legendary movies. Now I hear rumors of a new Pirates of the Caribbean movie without Johnny Depp, who has been cancelled. Now I hear that portraying orcs, trolls, witches, etc. as inherited evil beings is problematic. I wonder what Hans Christian Andersen, Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis would say about that. All this is strangely enough happening as Hollywood networks and studios pull TV series about cops off the air, while at the same time censoring and storytelling in ways that aim to please China's authoritarian political regime. Will this Hollywood self-destruction never end? Is the good old times, the golden days, truly over? If it was not for you, Rob, and your observations, I would have lost all hope by now. But I can see there are at least some sane people remaining in the world of TV, movies, and entertainment. But you may be a dying breed. I have to ask you this now before it's too late. Rob, what is your take on the future of Hollywood action, good versus evil adventures, movies with the glorified, justified, and sometimes humorous violence that I love so much? How do you imagine the next one, two, or three decades? With kind regards, your loyal Rob observationist and imagination connoisseur, David from Denmark. Well, David, that's you certainly don't ask the easy questions. I I tend to have faith in storytelling itself. I do. Because unlike some people who think art might be subjective, I think that great storytelling is objective, and I think we recognize it. And I think right now we have a lot of people who, a lot of people haven't had a chance to speak, their voices have not been heard, and now is a time when uh, a lot of people, especially younger people, are, they finally have their own voice, I guess, and they they get to affect or enact real change. Unfortunately, I think there is a certain lack of perspective in a lot of what's happening today. I mean, everybody's falling over themselves to be considered an ally, and they're willing to do all of these great things without really thinking about, well, how is this going to work into the future? You know, like the Chaz or the Chop or whatever, the... Capitol Hill zone, autonomous zone that was on Capitol Hill. People were going home yesterday because the idea, you know, it's all fun and games until, oh, three people get shot and then the authorities can't come in. They're being blocked. You want to do these things, but you realize how really difficult it is. And while pulling down statues and defunding the police might seem like a good idea when you're all full of piss and vinegar a year down the road, maybe not so much. And I tend to believe that, as you pointed out, cooler heads will prevail. We will realize that, look, our leadership, whether you choose to believe it or not, whatever side of the aisle you are on, I don't think you can say that especially our federal leadership over the last three and a half years has been very effective. They're really good at rescinding things other people have done, but they've been very, very remiss in building things that are new. Aside from, what, three miles of a wall on our thousand-mile border. Um, It's eventually, 
people tire of things that really aren't working. And I believe that the kind of storytelling that we're getting now, everybody's falling all over themselves to, yes, let's hire these great people. And it, great, you're hiring practices, terrific. But what you really want is what you want are sustainable things. You want to be able to hire the best people for the jobs that can tell the stories that need to be told that people are going to fall in love with. At the end of the day, it, you know what? The, the reality of the stories that you are telling they have to be true to themselves. And if the stories don't have truth in them, it doesn't matter what color the people are that are telling those stories, the audience will eventually reject those stories. They will. The, sto the reason we all love our stories, the reason we love our action adventure, the reason we love flights of fancy, the reason that we're imagination connoisseurs is because there are certain truths in those stories that we all responded to in some way, shape, or form. You know, you look at The Empire Strikes Back. Some people can say, okay, well, that's just, that's just a, you know, it's just a science fiction movie. But you know what? At its core, it's a science fiction movie about friendship, about love, about responsibility, about stepping up and doing your part. There's a lot of things in the Star Wars films, in the first, especially Star Wars and Empire, that, that go to basic core human truths that we all know. And that's why we fall in love with those things. Sure, the trappings are great. You know, I love my spaceships and robots and laser beams and space stations the size of moons. All that stuff is great. But at the end of the day, what makes those stories really great is they speak to basic human truths that we all want to believe in. And I think that that's what our greatest stories do. That's why I say right now we're going to have to endure a lot of agenda-based storytelling. All these overcorrections that are going to happen when everybody's going to be falling all over themselves to prove what allies they are to all these marginalized people. And that's fine. But they're not going to be telling stories that endure. They're not. Because you cannot put your agenda, the Burnett axiom, you cannot put your agenda in front of your characters or your story. Just like the axiom, you cannot put your universe in front of your characters and story, which they tried to do. They're like, the success of the Marvel Universe is because of its interconnectedness. No. The success of the Marvel Universe, the MCU, is successful because of the characters and the stories. The, the connected universe will take care of itself. You tell stories about great characters, and you tell great stories with those great characters, then people will buy into it. And that's always, always going to be the same. And the problem is, what people are going to find out, what people are going to find out is... It's really hard to make good movies and good television. and uh, You can't just hire people based on the superficiality of their skin color, their ethnic backgrounds, their sexuality. It's great that you want to hire those people. But at the end of the day, the stories themselves are what's going to speak for the future of our entertainment. It might be a little rocky for a while in terms of getting good stuff. You know, we might have to... But let's face it. You know what? A movie like Terminator Dark Fate, with all the good intentions in the world, it didn't work. It didn't work. And uh, it didn't work financially either. And what's interesting now is, is um, you know, there's a lot of other YouTube channels that I like that lean into this more than I do. Um, but for me, we're already seeing it happen. The financial realities of stories not working are with us already and um, ultimately it's great because Hollywood is the confluence of art and commerce and if the commerce isn't working out then the art's gonna have to change and ultimately stories don't care who writes them stories only care to be great and if they're not great they won't endure the great stories endure. The talented people that know how to write great stories will always rise to the top. You know what? It might be a little rough for some of us for a while, and rightfully so. We're going through an evolutionary period of time. I mean, I was never called. I was never dismissed. My opinion has never been dismissed more than it has been the last couple of years. I'm, I'm not just an, a white cis male anymore. Now I'm an old white cis male. So, I mean, I, have, I had conversations today where questions I've been raised, I, I was asking questions of someone and my opinion is just dismissed. 
And it's very interesting. It's very interesting to, to live in that world. And, you know, I want to say, okay, you know, I, I, I've, I've had this happen to me over the last couple months. There's been people I work with that turned around and made certain assumptions about me that really didn't know me at all. But, uh, so we have to endure. You know, you can't get bitter. If you're in it, I'm a lifer, man. I'll be trying to tell stories till I'm dead. You know, until I'm lying, until my, my body is cooling. Uh, I'll be doing something. And uh, I think we have to have faith. You have to have faith, David. Uh, I have faith in the stories themselves because the stories themselves will eventually win out. You know, even if we go into the Handmaid's Tale and it becomes we're starting to some, we, we live in some theocracy, eventually cooler heads will prevail. Power of stories, man. I do believe in it. I do believe in it. Thanks for the letter, though. What a great letter you wrote. This one comes from H.B. Haga. All the talk on your show today about interspecies relations got me thinking about Babylon 5. The subject comes up several times in the course of the show, with Ambassador Jakar of the Narn regime being a notorious womanizer of human, Narn, and Centauri females, going all the way back to the pilot episode. In one episode, the character of Commander Susan Ivanova had to contend with the delegate from an alien race that used intercourse to conclude treaties. After struggling with the concept, she finally tricks him in having sex Earth-style since he don't, didn't know anything about human mating. The concept of interspecies porn later comes up in the spin-off, comes up in the spin-off series Crusade when one crew member's stash accidentally falls into the captain's hands. There was even some footage of who's your little Pac Mara shot for the episode. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's it's I I would think that that uh, if we do meet other humanoid aliens, the idea of human sexuality will expand exponentially. Um, it'll be it'll be like, like I I mean, you think about like, come on, the diva who sings on uh, uh, Flossed in Paradise in the Fifth Element. I'd totally hook up with that blue chick. Come on, man. She was a babe, and she was talented. Would you say no to that? I don't know. I don't think you could. Um, but it'll be really interesting to see where we go. I hope I'm alive to see it. I don't think I will be. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't wait to see sitcoms. You know, the next Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, where you bring home, like, a an, an eight-armed, four-legged female from whatever planet, and your parents have to come to grips with that. Uh, I hope we live in that universe. I hope it happens, because I would like to see that. I won't, probably, but maybe someday in the future, somebody will. And uh, that'll be a, a, an interesting way we're all going to have to live. I mean, look at how hard it is we have to deal with uh, <laughs> how, how we have to deal with, with how people want to live their lives now. Imagine what's going to happen when we've got many species of aliens. I mean, can you imagine the um, Pornhub videos with, like, interspecies videos where you could have like it's a 10 species orgy i mean hentai videos will have nothing on that who knows um but yeah it's an ongoing topic here at observations kind of fun uh this one comes from gil cardinal bavel sin dear laser bob you know what they did to laser bob it was you me and laser bob if you're reading this on the show on 625 i am i'm having surgery on my broken ankle today I've had trouble getting my GoFundMe fundraiser past the quarter mark, so I was hoping you would toss it into the chat and mention it to all the rest of the intellectual dork web, we imagination connoisseurs. I just lost the subs uh, subsidies to my ACA insurance. By the way, Trump was apparently going to destroy the uh, ACA Act today. Uh, so just the monthly premium is over $870, and I'm already buried in medical bills, so here's the link if you would be so kind. Well, I did it once before. I'll do it again, and for you... You've been around for a long time. So I'm going to put that link in the live chat. So there you go. Um, it's strictly for medical bills, and I unfortunately can't prove income, so I haven't filed for taxes in the last two years as the only income I have is for my eBay sales and a small stipend I get for my family. I've received no $1,200 stimulus check either. I've been watching genre movies like you since I was a kid. Here in the Kansas City market, we were lucky enough to have Friday, night, Friday Fright Night with the shock package. Creature feature on Sunday nights, often triple features of mid-60s Euro horror, 
and Sundays at noon we had Science Fiction Adventure Theater. Boy, those were the salad days. I watched Godzilla and lots of it, Ray Harryhausen movies, and my prepubescent brain was stoked by the fires of movies like Tombs of the Blind Dead and the other Diosorio films. I love the Blind Dead movies. Mario Bava and, of course, Dario Argento. I've been a Whovian since the age of 12. My family watched Star Trek as far back as I can remember, and Star Wars changed my life as it did the rest of the world. And it goes without saying that I'm a George Romero and Stephen King freak, which he spelled with a Q and a U. I've been a professional writer and editor for many years, but I have yet to break out, even though my work appears in every library in the country. You can read some of my science fiction here. Uh, I will put this in the live chat as well. Uh, I love when people send me links to their work. Here it is. And there's more if you scroll down about halfway down the page under my regular name, Gil Bavel. Uh, is it Bavel? I guess it's Bavel, like Pavel. Gil Bavel. When my dad's family, I guess it is, lived in the Ukraine, it was Babel, Russian for Babylon. And when they moved to Palestine, they were Zionists. The family name changed from Hebrew for Babylon to Bavel, pronounced Bavel. <laughs> I grew up in a Reformed Jewish household and had a bar mitzvah, but I didn't get the hall you did. In fact, I got no gifts at all. <laughs> my mom read Herman Wolk and James Michener, and my dad was a science fiction nut. He taught computer science at the University of Kansas for almost 50 years, where I graduated from the Center of the Study for Science Fiction. Ooh, that's cool. I've been an imagination connoisseur my whole life, a genre fan film my whole life, and a voracious reader since I was four. So I do hope I can count on my tribe here to either help donate to my fundraiser or at least share it as often a share on social media as is a good donation. No amounts too small. Thanks, Rob, for all you do. Oh, I did have a question. Have you considered recording and releasing a director's commentary for Free Enterprise on the Burnett work as an MP3 so we can watch the movie and listen to the commentary at the same time? Well, the, the, the DVDs have commentary on them. This would give you a look back and an opportunity to tell us how you feel today huh, about the movie you really can't work on anymore. I think that would be awesome. And I think I speak for all of us now that we would watch your feature film and hear your comments about how you feel about it now. Thanks for all you do. Your voice is a moderating one on YouTube, and I think you really get it right most of the time. <laughs> your insights behind near, nearly every job in filmmaking are truly interesting and informative, and whining about movies is a more casual, behind-the-scenes look at teaching Elizabeth about film and, through her, us. Keep on keeping on, brother, and thanks for dropping the fundraiser for my medical bills in the chat. I appreciate it. Please watch The Seven Faces of Dr. Lau on Amazon for whining about movies. It's a positive, clever, and imaginative film that I think Elizabeth Gwendolyn Bell would love. With a fantastic screenplay by Charles Beaumont of the Twilight Zone fame, one of my favorite of his short stories is The Crooked Man, which should be of interest to all readers, not just those in the LGBTQ community. Well, Gil, uh, I want to thank you again for a good letter. I did share your link and uh, I can share that on social media, too. Uh, I'll put that on uh, Twitter. Uh, the Justin is here, and he, the Justin corrected me. I was trying to say, Justin, I didn't know. It's just Justin, and he writes that way. Uh, it's cool. I like, it's the, the, J-U-S-T, capital N. So it's Justin. Hello, Rob. The Justin here with another rambling rant. Amidst all the controversy in today's social climate, I decided, I decided to start another fire. The last Jedi's portrayal of Luke Skywalker was amazing. Before I start, I'm well aware the film has its detractors. Really? Does The Last Jedi have detractors? And I'm not trying to change someone's opinion of the movie as a whole. There are lots of missteps taken, and I completely understand the hatred toward it. Hell, I'm even conflicted by it. But there is one aspect of The Last Jedi I would like people to reconsider. Luke Skywalker. For over 30 years, Luke Skywalker resided in our collective imaginations, and like everyone, I was expecting him to be an all-powerful Jedi Master, free from sin. In Hamill's absence, fans have been gorging themselves on the EU and Legends books for decades, patiently awaiting Luke's return. However, none of us was prepared, was prepared for how bold and polarizing Ryan Johnson's vision of Skywalker would be. From the moment Luke threw his father's lightsaber over his shoulder into the ravine below, I was hooked. That first gesture showed we were in for something new, and anything new was desperately needed after The Force Awakens. This Luke wasn't the wild-eyed farm boy or dashing Jedi Knight. This was old man Luke, a war-hardened veteran, tired and dejected. 
I didn't mind Harrison and Carrie's last portrayals of Han and Leia, but they were more or less the same characters they'd always been. Leia became a general, still fighting the good fight, and Han returned to the streets like a junkie falling off the wagon. Somebody's got to run that spice, son. But isn't that predictable? We never actually believed Han and Chewie would settle down and give up a life of smuggling, and we always knew Leia was destined for political greatness. This was one of the primary concerns fans had with Abram's film. So with Luke, we just assumed he'd be still fighting on the front lines, or at the very least, somewhere powerfully meditating. Because of this assumption, I feel Luke's fall from grace was much more effective. To see him on a backwater planet overcome by regret and guilt was depressing, but more importantly, it was interesting. The loudest critique that sprung from fans regarding The Last Jedi was not my Luke Skywalker. Well, maybe not, but that does not invalidate this version of Luke especially when Hamill's grizzled and wary performance hinted at a lifetime of war and adventure. Adventures that I'm hoping we can still see someday. Maybe Sebastian Stan in a Luke Disney Plus series. A bruh can dream. I feel a lot of people confuse the Luke for the space Jesus allegory originally meant for Anakin. If Luke inherited many things from Anakin, including his forced sensitivity and even his lightsaber, why wouldn't he inherit his father's anger and hatred? Or even worse, inherit his fear. When entering into the Dagobah Caves, Luke sees a vision of Vader, and upon killing that vision, sees himself in the Dark Lord's helmet. In Return of the Jedi, the Emperor goads Skywalker into striking down his father, and Luke defiantly throws down his lightsaber, refusing to do so. Luke's greatest fear is turning to the dark side like his father before him, so why would his reaction be when he gives into that fear as a seasoned Jedi Master? By nearly turning to the dark side and striking down his own nephew, he inadvertently creates a new Vader leading to the suffering of millions. As Master Yoda put it, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. This was too much for Luke to bear. In the context of the story, Luke is much more consistent than he's given credit for. I know fans love to bring up how Luke is portrayed in some obscure Dark Horse comic from the 90s, but remember when it comes to Star Wars, the movies are the source material, not the novels, not the comics, or the films. So Luke's failure and victories in The Last Jedi reflect the same character he's always been, just messier. Reactionary before calm, confident before humbled, Luke's character development is learning that despite his mastery of the Force, he can still make mistakes. He can still succumb to fear. And even among those mistakes, he was able to force project himself clear across the galaxy and appear before thousands of soldiers, living up to his mythic legend and inspiring a new generation of rebels. Unfortunately, we will never see Luke's true impact of Luke's heroic final act. Abram's Rise of Skywalker played like fan fiction, and all of the interesting character exploration was thrown out the window. It was truly a film made by committee. For all its faults, the same cannot be said about The Last Jedi. In comparison, I believe that Picard's greatest failure as a story is not honoring who the character was in The Next Generation. The writers were making Star Trek for people who weren't Star Trek fans, so their portrayal of Picard was inconsistent with morals and ideals of the character. Regardless of the story being told, Picard would never be the Picard of the series, and thousands of hours of Next Generation to reference, there was absolutely no excuse for getting that character so wrong. There was no character development in Picard, just character regression. I bet Luke looks a whole lot better by comparison now, huh? Well, Justin, a great letter, sir, and let me tell you, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I'm someone who quite enjoyed The Last Jedi for all of the reasons that you state, and let me give you, you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. Omar94 says, hi, Rob. You mentioned several times how movies are products of the time they were released. However, there are some movies released in the 20th century that I think uh, are relevant today now more than ever. Three movies in particular come to mind for me. Those movies are Fritz Lang's Metropolis, the original 1987 Robocop, and 1993's Demolition Man. The themes in those movies are problems we still deal with today, from corruption, authoritarianism, social class, capitalism, etc. I'm sure the filmmakers never expected their movies to stay relevant, but it's very impressive the stories they told had those relevant issues. Thanks, and live long and prosper. Hey, I just got a message from Elizabeth. She says, can I please tell people to be civil in the chat? She's never sent me that before. Are you people being not civil? This is a civil place. Uh, that is my mandate here, is that we are supposed to be civil. That's what we do. That's what we imagination connoisseurs are supposed to be doing. Uh, please be civil. Please 
that's what this channel is all about. Speaking of which, uh, let me go back to um, uh, what people were saying here. There's a lot of stuff coming in. Damo Davies sends in a tip and says, I heard a rumor from Midnight's Edge that the WB is courting Tim Burton to direct a Batman Beyond movie with Johnny Depp to play the Joker in the return of the Joker's storyline, retroactively making Burton's Batfleck, Batflix a trilogy. I think I just had a tiny orgasm. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but as we've been talking about on this channel, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Damo Davies continues. He says, greetings from the United Kingdom. Are you a fan of John Carpenter's Starman with Karen Allen and Jeff Bridges? I purchased it on Blu-ray recently and thought it was heartwarming and earnest. A genuine surprise coming considering Car Carpenter's other movies. I love Starman. Uh, in a way, I think it might be Carpenter's greatest film. I know it was a director for hire job that he took after The Thing. Um, he made Christine before that. He made The Thing, then he made Christine, then he made Starman. Both movies I really like. I think Starman is a wonderful movie. Uh, Jeff Bridges was nominated for an Academy Award for playing the alien who loved Jenny Hayden. Uh, Charles Martin Smith. I, I, I love everything about Starman. Uh, just Jack Nietzsche did the score. Such a great movie. Love it, love it, love it, love it. And true awe and wonder at the end when uh, the alien ship comes back to the meteor crater in Arizona. Great stuff. Willow is here. Willow sends in a tip and says, In Blade Runner 2049, Wallace said that we've lost our stomach for slaves unless engineered. If he had achieved his goal of creating replicants capable of procreating, would that cause humans to recognize them as persons and not want to use them? I think so. Look, I think that Wallace knew that mankind, kind of like what happens in the movie AI, Wallace knew that that uh, his engineered humans were more human than human. Stronger, faster, better. I think that's what Wallace saw himself. Look, I got the idea. It's not overt in Blade Runner 2049, but I got the, the impression that humanity was dying out in that movie. That's why there, the, the streets were not choked with as many extras. It's definitely subtextual, I think, but humanity is dying out. That's why uh, people can have holographic girlfriends, like replicants can have, a, uh, but other people can too, because there's just not enough people to go around. So I think that that's what Wallace is trying to do. The reason he wants to have procreating replicants is to save humanity. And if replicants can then procreate, because remember, replicants aren't machines. They're just bio they're just engineered human beings. They're put together. You know, their 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 organs are grown and their eyeballs, whatever. They're manufactured, but they're human. So they're more human than human. And so I I think you're right. Because look, replicants were were engineered to to be in servitude. They were they were a slave race. You know? And I think you're absolutely right about that. I think that that was part of it, but I think it was also to replace us because we were dying out. Gerald says, now that the Hills Run Red Blu-ray is out, has any of the cast members or crew reached out to congratulate you and reminisce about making the film? Well, it's funny that you say that, Gerald. Uh, as those of you who might not know me, <laughs> the Hills Run Red, a movie that I produced, is recently out on Blu-ray. By the way, I don't pay people to keep saying this. I just like doing this because it's hilarious. Maybe it'll get old this week, but who knows? Uh, it came out last week on Scream Factory, and of course, Dave Parker and I, the director and I, Worked very hard on our film that we produced. We created six and a half hours of new special features. Uh, and we encourage anybody, even if you don't like the movie, you can pick it up and learn a lot. Um, you know, I still keep in touch with some of the crew. There's a lot of our technical crew that I'm friends with on Facebook. And I go back and forth a lot. And some people have, like uh, Rachel Vasilev, who played Babyface, the killer. He's been following all of our posts. And I think he's really going to like the disc. Uh, he'll he'll definitely be able to reminisce about it, but you know it's you, you. What's great about Facebook is, especially when you go work on things from all. There's people I'm Facebook friends with that I've worked on various projects over the last twenty years, and it's it's great. It's great for that. I love it. I love that. Um, but they haven't called up since the disc, or they haven't contacted me since the disc came out. Probably because most people don't have it yet. Uh, the GMTC podcast sends in a super chat and said, I was born after The Thing came out, but I'm fortunate enough to have seen it twice in the theater since then. One of the best sci-fi horror movies ever. Well, first of all, thanks for supporting the channel. I totally agree with you, and it's so effective on the big screen. The Thing is so much fun to watch on the big screen, especially with that the uh, soundtrack. I just got a reissue of the soundtrack in the mail uh, the other day. 
and uh, it's very exciting, very exciting. But I, I can't, I can't uh, agree with you more. Claudius is here. Hello, Claude. I loved reading your letter, by the way. Bonjour, Robert. Blade Runner missing Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek that portrayed a future where there was a positive relationship between humans and AI. AI is just another form of life like the Horda on Janus 6 in Star Trek's The Devil in the Dark. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, and I think that once AI exists, when AI especially starts procreating itself, you're absolutely correct. And we saw that. I mean, we saw that all the way back to episodes in The Next Generation, like, well, the Horda, obviously, but in, in AI really started to be dealt with in TNG, data being one. But even the god-awful first season episode, Home Soil, deals with that. But yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, we are a little paranoid that machines are going to destroy us all. Um, Stubble McShave sends in a tip and says, Raiders of the Lost Ark was a star-making movie. Do you think Tom Selleck would have been a bigger name today if he hadn't been forced to honor his Magnum P.I. contract? He's certainly a charismatic person, and I think he'd done a great job as Indy. You know, maybe. I mean, maybe. I think it would have been a different kind of a movie. But you know what? Having success in television like he has, long-term TV success can be far more lucrative than being a movie star. Being a movie star, if you're a movie star like Tom Cruise, that's great. But there's a lot more money to be made in television if you play your cards right. So, I don't know. I mean, he's still on Blue Bloods. He's had a nice career. He's worked a lot. And if you calculate the hours that he spent making TV, he's probably made a lot more entertainment than he would have if he was a movie star. So, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting question. Mark Evans sends in a tip and says, The thing scared the crap out of me when I first saw it, and that wasn't even in a theater. I can't imagine what that would have been like at 14 years old. I think it was scarier than Alien. Critical Drinker just did a nice drinker recommend recommends on Blade Runner. Mark, you're absolutely right. I'm a big fan of the Critical Drinker on, uh, on YouTube. I love his videos. He did a great Blade Runner for the anniversary, a, a great drinker recommends piece on Blade Runner. It's gushing with praise, so I, uh, if you like the movie... You should definitely watch it. Thanks for that recommendation and that reminder, Mark. But yeah, I mean, it, it was, the thing was, I mean, it was different than Alien. I have to tell you, though, Alien in a theater, like, I had, no, not knowing what it was, and it was, I couldn't get anyone to take me. It was so irksome. And my grandmother had passed away, so my grandfather um, needed stuff to do. And I, I, well, I don't feel that bad about it now. But I think at the time, I coerced him into taking me to see Alien, me and my sister. And I'm like, yeah, it's just like, you know, it's like Star Wars. <laughs> I was sitting there. I was terrified. I loved it, but I was terrified. And uh, it, I don't know. I wasn't as terrified in the thing. Because, I mean, Alien. Whew, maybe if I saw it in the theater. But I did. I mean, I saw the thing in the theater. But if I saw it the UA-150 on that bigger screen, maybe. It was amazing. Claudius goes on and t sends in a tip and says, Blade Runner 2049, let's not forget the Blade Runner movies as well as aliens to provide a picture of hope for android-humanoid relations. Deckard has a child with an android. It's true. Although, replicants really aren't androids. You know, I think that's an important distinction, that replicants are, they're human beings. They're just manufactured, you know. Um, but the biology is there. Stubble McShave says, sends in a tip and says what would you prefer a very financially successful movie that's forgotten after a year or two or a financial flop that gets cult status and becomes a very revered movie several years later well one of those things i'm very familiar with <laughs> so to be honest right now i would love to have a financially successful movie that's forgotten after a year or two if only because it would free up my life to concentrate on working on another financially successful movie i mean it's it's been very hard to um, you know, especially now, I've been lucky. The special features and working on the, I'm working on another episode of uh, the unannounced show that I've been working on tomorrow. So that's always a good thing. Always a good thing. Um, yeah. So there you go. Mark C is here. Mark C says, Rob, I just won on eBay a comic book Grail item. In one week, I will be the proud owner of the 1982 DC style guide drawn by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. That is awesome. Um, that's fantastic. I love Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. He replaced George Perez drawing Teen Titan, New Teen Titans. And, of course, he drew my beloved Atari Force. Man, that is awesome. Send in pictures, man. I want to see that. I'd love to see like like some of the, the characters, like his Teen Titans. 
I'd love to see what's in that style guide. Uh, Bob Kowal is here, and he sends in a tip and says, I saw Carpenter on Letterman before the thing came out. They showed a good hunk of the dog cage scene. Letterman remarked, so it's a story about a boy and his dog, and later remarked, kids will be lining up around the equator to see this one. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, is that what he, I guess that's what he really said. I got to go look that up. I'm sure the clip's on YouTube. That's funny. Fortunato sends in a tip and says, Hey, RMB, a.k.a. the cool kid, thanks for not being a hater. Well, I just want to point out to both Claude and to you, Fortunato, that I am a hater. I'm a bona fide hater of Star Trek Discovery and of Star Trek Picard. But, but, as many people know, and, uh, you know, I came clean yesterday, and which I did. I mean, I, I did. I, um... You know, I, I, uh, I, uh, I did. I, 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 I bought that Enterprise model. So I'm not totally a hater, but yes, I know. I'm glad. I'm not a hater. I'm not a hater, Fortunato. Even, you know, I, there's a couple things. Irksome. Mark C is back and says, Claude generalizes too much. Having been called a hater, I'm not a contrarian. Cancel culture is actively changing our entertainment with their ideology with little regard as to who will enjoy it. Some have admitted to intentionally upsetting fans on purpose. I, I agree with you, man. I mean, I, I, again, you are going to lose. If your idea is you're, you, you think you're going to change the status quo by, by bringing your agenda-driven storytelling, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You will ultimately fail because you are not being true to the stories that you're telling. And that's all I'm saying. Is, is that agenda-driven storytelling will always lose. You will always lose. And that's not me going, I'm not against having agendas, but if you want to tell a story and make a point, the point you're trying to make should be baked into your narrative, baked into your characters. You know, if you're trying, like, don't be didactic with what you're, what you're trying to tell people. You've got to make your stories ring true. Make your characters ring true. Otherwise, your stories will fail and your point will be lost. And, and so I agree. The cancel culture is changing our entertainment. And the fact that people, I don't understand what people's, what are people trying to do? If you're going to bring up somebody's comedy bits from 20 years ago and say they're problematic, what is it you're saying? What you are doing or you are putting yourself in some position as, what are you now judge, jury, and executioner? Do you know better than me or do you know better than someone else? Who made you that? Who turned you into that? I mean, that's totalitarian, dictatorial behavior, and that kind of behavior should not be tolerated. I mean, right now, we're going through an interesting uh, thing. Um, yeah, uh, I'm with you, Mark. Bob Kowal sends in a tip and says, another aspect to the damsel in distress. Many men have an instinctive urge to protect the damsel. They are more emotionally invested in the female prevailing than they would be for a man in peril. That and of course, boobies. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, one of the things people don't ever take into consideration is we are animals. We are the products of millions of years of evolution. And we are hardwired, biologically programmed as men to protect women. Why? To perpetuate our species. Life will find a way. At the end of the day, and this is something that I, 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 I find very difficult to come to terms with. Well, I don't find it I find it difficult to come to terms with the fact that people can't seem to come to terms with this when you are discussing this. Ultimately, our biological programming trumps a lot of everything else. And the fact is, let's go back to simple the simple idea of the fact that we it takes two people to tango, it takes a male and a female to perpetuate the species. So our biology comes out of that. And the idea that men are supposed to protect women it's it's because of our biological programming and it all comes from there and for much of human history our roles were clearly defined um, women had to bear children and then take care of them at home while men went out and were the hunter gatherers because if not our species would not be here anymore and for most of human history that was true now, in the modern day, when everybody is screaming about gender roles and men and women, no one ever talks about the fact that 
Well, for tens of thousands of years, we worked a certain way. Now, because we live in the modern age, things are different. But instead of bitching and moaning and complaining about traditional gender roles, why don't we all understand that these traditional gender roles are why we are here today? But everyone wants to cast them aside because they want what they want right now. I exist right now, so I need to have it exactly the way I want it to be right now. History be damned. Biology be damned. I just want it the way it is right now. That's a mistake. It's a mistake. It also is fundamentally a stupid position to take. If you're not taking into consideration where we've come from and you want to make decisions on where we're going, we're never going to get there. You have to have a multi-dimensional approach to all of these issues. I understand right now you're all full of piss and vinegar and you want to have it you want to have it the way you want it to have it. I I want all marginalized people to have a voice. I do too. You know, I do too. But you know, they still have to have a voice. They still have to develop a voice. They can't just you can't you can't throw someone to the deep end of the pool if they don't know how to swim. And and right now what we have to do is we have to concentrate on giving people the ability to know how not only to swim, but to know how to function in the world. That's why these problems will be alleviated if we concentrate at first and foremost on what I say all the time, two things. We must make sure that we have the best educated population on the planet. How do we do that? That means we have to start throwing hundreds of millions, if not trillions of dollars in to make sure that every kid in this country, even if they're from disadvantaged neighborhoods or broken homes, that's they need more money. You know, don't just give money to privileged environments. We need everybody needs every kid needs to have the best education they have. They need to have teachers that are incredibly well paid. They need to have after school programs. They need to have the ability to stretch and examine their own lives. Music programs, arts programs, drama programs, sports programs, whatever. After school programs that allow a kid to explore and find out who they are. That's what we need more of. All of our problems will be solved then. We also have to make sure everybody's healthy. And we have to make sure that income inequality goes away. Get rid of poverty in this country, which we can do. Think about it. You get rid of poverty and you put money into education and you take care of health care. Those three things will solve most of our societal ills. But what's how, how's that going to look on the next fiscal quarter? How are you going to pay for all that? Well, you know how you pay for that? By the riches you get from an educated population 20 years down the line. Imagine what they're going to do. Imagine what some kid today, if he has the proper educational tools, is going to be able to dream up in 20 years if he's well-educated or she's well-educated and you know didn't have to worry about food and didn't have to worry about going to the doctor and could concentrate instead on exploring who they are as people and what they have to offer and what they might be able to create. If you don't have, if you're a kid that doesn't have arts programs or music programs or sports programs or drama programs or writing programs or whatever the hell programs you want, what if a kid who could have been our next Rembrandt or our next Shakespeare, what if they never even were able to explore that facet of their talent and they never knew they were going to be the next Shakespeare because they went to some shitty underfunded school district? Think about that. That's what we got to do. Think about all the people that, you know, it's like Roy Batty. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. I've seen attack ships on the shoulder of Orion. I've seen sea beams glittering in the dark near the Tannhauser Gates. You know what? He was able to see those things. Sure, he was a replicant, but he was off-world. We need to make sure that every kid that's born from now on has the opportunity to explore their own personalities, their own talents, their own abilities, and find out because they've had the mentorship and they've had the ability to explore who they're going to be. Because you know how you profit from that? In 20 years, when that kid and all of the kids turn out to be exceptional in one way, shape, or form or another, think of the society that we could have. But it's not going to happen if we don't have well-funded schools, and I mean all schools, and well-paid teachers. Perhaps, I mean, people talk about socialism. Look, we have lots of socialism in our country already. So I don't think providing for education should be considered necessarily socialistic. What you're investing is you're planting a seed. You know, and who knows, as Spock said, what, what will flower from the seed you planted today. I don't get it, man. Um, let's see, uh, Rang the Mang sends in a super chat and says, Hey Rob, wondering what you think will happen with Army of the Dead. Ooh, I was waiting for somebody to ask this question. Now with all the allegations against, against Chris D'Elia, would love your thoughts. Well, for those of you who don't know, comedian Chris D'Elia, 
Well, I actually met because we cast him in something once that didn't get made. Um, Chris D'Elia, as a lot of guys have, we have, it comes to light that they use their positions and their celebrity to, you know, meet hot chicks. And uh, Chris D'Elia apparently was soliciting a lot of underage girls knowingly. Now, I don't know all the details. I did see that one clip that's going around when he realizes that his Snapchat, yeah, it goes away, but you can <laughs> screen capture anything. Whatever. Um, now Chris D'Elia is in Army of the Dead. Here's my thoughts. There's a lot of people that worked on that movie. And when an actor is hired to play a part in the film, are are we going to negate all the hard work the hundreds and hundreds of people who put in on that movie? Are we going to negate that? Can we separate the art from the artist? I mean, I don't know. It's problematic. It's a Netflix movie. I don't know what Netflix is going to do about it. Maybe they'll do. They'll pull a Christopher Plummer and they'll replace Kevin Spacey, you know? like uh, all the money in the world like Ridley Scott did but but I you know I don't think that that everybody who worked on Army of the Dead or Netflix that put up all the money should be punished because Chris D'Elia is was an ass you know um I don't know if he committed any crimes I I I don't know I know he hasn't certainly hasn't been convicted people are especially dudes man you know, we live in a world now where the first thing you do if you're a dude is you get attention from girls, and, you know, that's when you have to l allow yourself to uh, step up to the plate. It's very simple. You know what's right and wrong. You know, if you're a celebrity and you're hitting on underage girls, I'm like, how about not do that? How about not do that? You know you're not supposed to. It's bad. Don't do it. You know, or... You know, practice the campground philosophy. And the campground philosophy is always leave people better off when you leave them than when you met them. And I'm not saying you should still mess around with underage girls. Absolutely not. But, you know, the way things are going now, the way people are using your celebrity, it's very easy to do that. And you have to, I mean, Crystalia, he, he, he abused it. He abused it. And... Um, there is a reckoning, but I, when it comes to the movies, it, look, it's a tough call, man. I don't, I don't know. I, I just know how hard it is to make a film. And, and for Zack Snyder's sake, it's like no one who worked on army of the dead. It's not their fault. And, uh, I would hope that the movie does get to see the light of day. It's a tough issue though. It's tough. And I might be a little flippant. I don't mean to be flippant, but I mean, Watching Chris D'Elia, it's it's like he knows he was getting away with something. And if the question you have to ask yourself is, are you doing something that you know is knowingly wrong to get away with it? Because why? Uh, he knows he he knows he's guilty. He knows he's wrong. And uh, just don't do that. But it's a tough call. Uh, Mark C says, if we're talking interspecies relationships, forget Babylon Five. I'm headed to Farscape. Hey man, even in Farscape, even the spaceships give birth. I mean, what does that say? I'm telling you, Farscape had, Farscape had some, some definitely some interesting alien life that I would like to get closer to, if you know what I'm saying. But even like Moya, right? Come on. I mean, imagine if you knew that Moya was a girl, you get to walk around inside her all day. How cool is that? I don't know what that says about me, but there you go. Um, Damo Davies sends in a tip and says, Well-deserved congratulations to my football team, Liverpool Football Club, with eight games still to play until the end of the season. Tonight we became English Premier League champions after 30 years. Well done, the Reds. Well, football team, Liverpool Football Club, congratulations to you after 30 years. Richly deserved. I hope you party hardy um, and, and have Kilkenny, the cream of Ireland, for me because I can never get Kilkenny, the cream of Ireland, here. It's very hard. I got I got hooked on Kilkenny when I was in New Zealand, and I just I can't find it. It's very hard. Um, can't even find cans of it. Do they even make cans of it? I don't know. 
Richard sends in a tip and says, what are your thoughts on Section 31? Before they were introduced, it was assumed by me the Federation had achieved its ideals naturally, but ever since Section 31 became a thing, there was this inference that instead of the Federation being maintained by a futuristic but perhaps naive idealism, it's replaced by a very familiar historic idea that paradise can be achieved if the right people are dealt with. That's what I've always taken from it, especially later in Section 31's appearances. Well, Richard, I'll tell you something. I loved Section 31 when it was just Sloan. We didn't see anything except Sloan. And he we know what he said, but you know, now they've tried to flesh it out, and certainly Star Trek Discovery has completely ruined any interest that I have in Section 31. We've got membership cards and headquarters. They missed the fucking point. So you never really knew. Like I I even Sloan says it wasn't really a part of the Federation or something. Uh, I like the idea that Section 31 might be completely autonomous and operating on their own. I, 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 I never saw it as interfering with the Federation ideals. Like I, I, it, ne it was not something I felt that it was like that. But that's how I, that's how I looked upon it. Because I, I always liked it. Uh, Mark C. sends in a tip and says, My father is directly or indirectly responsible for the death of thousands, including children. I must save him. My nephew hasn't killed anyone, but I sense the dark side within him. I need to murder him in his sleep. <laughs> well, you could look at it that way. I mean, I think Luke probably saw the future of what was going to happen. I think Luke saw the rise of the First Order, and, and maybe that was That's the way I, I read it, is that he saw, he saw the first... And, and look what happened. I mean, in The Force Awakens, billions of people died. The core system was, or whatever, destroyed. So Luke wasn't wrong. And that's the way I always saw it. So when you find out what happened, I, I always saw that Luke saw where the, that the First Order would rise and Luke saw what Kylo Ren's part would be in it. So that's how I saw it. But I don't necessarily think, I understand why people feel the way. I think a lot of people feel that way. So Claudia says, hashtag cool girl. Rob, I really like the amazing Amy monologue. It's perfect. It's very thought provoking. But I think Paula Bowler's Vesna or Willow need to critique that one. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know what Paula, Vesna, or Willow... All I know is that one day I want to get really drunk with Vesna, Willow, and Paula. Like, we should all go to Europe and go hang out with Vesna and Willow. I mean, I mean, Paula, Willow, me, Elizabeth, you, anybody. We should all, we should all go to Sarajevo. I want to go to Sarajevo. And we'll all go hang out and we'll get Vesna really drunk because I want to see what she'd do. I bet it would be awesome. Um, so yes, but they do need to critique Gone Girl. Have they, have none of them read it? Willow, you know what, Willow, please watch Gone Girl if you haven't seen it and, and write, write a letter about what you think about the whole cool girl philosophy that amazing Amy espouses in the film. I'd love to hear your take on it. Um, Richard sends in a tip and says, word on the street is that Discovery season three is the worst thing they ever made. <laughs> Please watch it for us. I know Picard was painful for you, but look at it this way. It was very entertaining to us. Oh, Richard, I can assure you, I will watch Star Trek Discovery Season 3 with bated breath. I can't wait. Because maybe, maybe if it's as god-awful as it's being reported, although I never believe that, that there's too much wishful thinking, If it, it might be passable. I mean, I hope it's god-awful. Um... Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I hope so. Um, but we'll see. Because then the, it'd be the nail in their coffin. I know, I shouldn't... I, I don't want to... It, it, it bothers me that I wish for the demise of the entire modern era of Star Trek because it put people out of work, and I, I feel guilty. I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted by it, but it's true. Um, Honest Asian Guy sends in a tip and says, Hey, Rob, just picked up 88 films. Ooh, 2K restored Blu-ray of Operation Condor. And the transfer looks amazing. Probably the best that the film has ever looked. This and Drunken Master 2 are bonafide classics. They are. You know what? I was going to get Operation Condor, but now that you... I, I, I didn't order it, but now that you say it's good, I will get it. Uh, Richard sends in a tip and says, Did you watch the Foundation trailer? Hell yeah. You'd think the one good thing about a tech oligopoly like Apple is that they would make the connection and narcissistically see themselves as a kind of Foundation and commit a little effort. But no, it's Game of Thrones in space. Well, Richard, let's wait and see. 
I know people are already mad about the gender swapping, but I, I it looked pretty cool to me, and I love Jared Harris's Harry Seldon. I, I hope it's good. I, it looks good. I mean, some of that stuff looked like it was a Chris Foss painting, like especially that spaceship over the... And he did work for Foundation. I, I want it to be good. Hope springs eternal. Yes, it does. So I hope it is good. Um, this letter comes from... Um, John Willis Willis. Uh, I'm looking for your RMB... Hey, Rob, I'm looking for your RMB seal of approval for best TOS and DS9 collections on physical media. In return, I'll send you my latest musings on reconciling Trekkian transtator physics from the original series with Star Trek The Next Generation. It's not much, but long ago and far away when I was going to college and I hated the first season of Next Gen and had to sit down and figure out my mind's eye just what had happened in the last 97 years to Federation science, believe it or not, it still kind of made sense. On another topic, do you attend the Star Trek convention in Vegas? I was thinking of going in December, but I really don't like the new series. But I was hoping to see some of the old cast and perhaps yourself leading a discussion panel. Thanks for all you do and keeping the fires of our imagination fully lit. John Willis. Well, John, I used to go all the time, but then I was sort of persona non grata. And I did run uh, discussion panels. Um, look, the best Star Trek The Next Generation to get is obviously the Blu-ray. Get the Blu-ray collection. You can get it cheap now. Um, of course, we did all the special features for it. Uh, Roger Lay and I produced them all, along with the Okudas. Uh, so I would get that. The Deep Space Nine, just get the latest DVDs. That's all you can get. Unfortunately, I wish you could get more. But I, you know, I wasn't planning on going um, uh, if, unless I had something to promote. But uh, Or if they might have asked me, but I have spoken a lot at conventions, uh, those uh, creation conventions, in the past. I just haven't done it since 2014. Adam Blue is here. Hey, Rob, recently you've been talking about existential dread in horror and actors playing roles that society might not be into. One film that seems to encapsulate these themes for me. The example you've mentioned in Scarlett Johansson's Ghost in the Shell. I had no prior knowledge of Ghost in the Shell because my ignorance of Japanese anime, but the movie trailer looked kick-ass. I heard the controversy of her casting, and while a part of me felt bad for not understanding what it meant for this film, I still went to see it. I liked it so much. I bought it on 4K when released. In the context of the movie, it's interesting to find out who the character is, and it does seem kind of odd that even in-universe, the race was changed. But it made no impact on the movie, and I still loved it. But I'm open to understand the criticism. The next part is the existential dread or similar feeling the movie gives off. This might be a bit spoilery, but it has to do with the protagonist and the antagonist. It has to do with two people deeply in love, and that is taken away, and slowly... The characters find out about their real lives and how it's all gone. To me, it was very well laid out in the movie and really made me connect. I even did tear up a bit. Anyway, I just wanted to touch on how this controversial movie really has a lot going for it, but society trying to write itself sometimes targets art in a way that leaves it out of the conversation. But I want to be sensitive to those trying to speak up. What is your overall thoughts on the movie? Did you feel that existentialism, or is it a personal thing I took from it? Well, I'll tell you, Adam... No, I think it's definitely there. That's obviously part of the story. I think they did a pretty good job with it. I didn't love it, but I thought they did a pretty good job with it. It always, you know, what I find strange is that, look, in the movie, should they have had an Asian actress play the part? Perhaps. But again, I fall back to the economics of movie making. What Japanese actors could they have hired that they could have justified spending all that money on? They need... Hollywood studios work a certain way. You can't change the economics of Hollywood. And the only reason that movie got made is because Scarlett Johansson was in the lead role. There is no Japanese actress that you can say that has the drawing power worldwide of Scarlett Johansson. If there was, they probably would have hired her assuming she was right for the role. And that's what people don't understand. Like It's like the, 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 movie, that, the movie about the trans man she was going to star in. That movie's now not getting made. It might not ever get made. Now, is the world better off not seeing that story translated into a pretty what could have been a great movie? Wouldn't this? Wouldn't the world be better off knowing that story so people can look into that story and and that that movie will endure and maybe it'll it, it would be a positive thing for trans rights moving into the future? People are so short sighted about these things. I don't understand. What you want is you want these stories to be told. 
Ghost in the Shell probably would not have been made in the United States unless someone like Scarlett Johansson or somebody similar played that role. And the fact that the movie, look, it is an earnest adaptation of the source material. They certainly tried. I don't think it works as good as I would have wanted it to work, but it's still, it's definitely something that's respectable. It wasn't god-awful. It wasn't a, a, a trash, a dumpster fire at all. And that you connected with it proves that. And isn't it great? Isn't it great that there's a movie that you connected with in that way? That's what movies are all about, man. And isn't it... Wouldn't you rather live in a world where that movie exists? My question is always, isn't it better to live in a world where something cool like that exists than to live in a world where it doesn't? Like, at the end of the day, one, that movie employed a whole lot of people. Two, a lot of people found out about Ghost in the Shell, like yourself, that didn't even know what it was. You know, when that new Netflix series dropped a couple months back, people like, oh, there's a new... People who are fans of the anime, the animated series, whatever, the manga. Everybody, everybody comes out right. And it just increases it increases the 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 visibility of the entire franchise, and it's turned out a fan in you. So isn't it good that it exists? I think so. Uh, Victor Rosario Fermain. I hope that is that a French word for Fermain? Fermain. I think it's probably Victor Rosario Fermain. Dear Robert, oh, it's your first letter. I hope I get that right, Victor. Victor Rosario Fermain. I think. I think. F-E-R-M-A-I-N for Maine. T is silent. Uh, Dear Robert, first letter, here we go. I was pleasantly surprised when you said on the John Campia show that you're a fan of Trilogy of Terror and especially of the final tale. (laughs) The one with the cuddly Zuni fetish doll with the jagged teeth and the butcher knife. I'm a child of the 60s and like you, I refuse to grow up completely. That also means that I remember 70s television clearly, although from a different filter, because what we got back then in Puerto Rico, USA was shown delayed and translated to Spanish on local channels. No ABC, NBC, or CBS yet. Cable TV had not yet come to the rescue. When it did, a bit later in the decade, we finally caught up with the mainland. Trilogy is the best example I can think of. The wealth of macabre classics broadcasted back then to our antenna-bound small screens, but not the only one. I still recall being chilled to the bone by the sight of Liz Montgomery, our bewitching Samantha Stevens, grabbing an axe to kill her father in the legend of Lizzie Borden. I wouldn't doubt that from Endora, but not you, Sam. (laughs) It was the era when the sinister Barnabas Collins was on the prowl, and the bumbling yet courageous reporter Carl Kolchak was running from the creature of the week. We also had Toby Hooper's faithful adaptation of Stephen King's Salem's Lot, starring David Soule, Bonnie Bedelia, and James Mason, and the recently departed Fred Willard. That miniseries was the talk of my high school the whole week it first screened. I don't think we'd seen vampire children before, and they freaked us out. Other creepy stuff comes to mind is Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, Jack Palance's Dracula, and Rod Serling's Night Gallery series. The Universal Monsters and the Hammer Fright Fests popped up frequently here and there, too. And when they didn't, Marvel, DC, and Warren Horror Comics and Magazine saved the day. But I digress. Karen Black starred in all three segments of Trilogy of Terror. Julie, Millicent and Therese, and Amelia. Stories written by the gigantic Richard Matheson, author of I Am Legend, Hell House, What Dreams May Come, A Stir of Echoes, The Incredible Shrinking Man, Somewhere in Time, and Duel. He also wrote scripts for some of them, as well as Corman's mystic horror com The Raven, The Night Stalker, and over a dozen episodes of The Twilight Zone. Amelia was Matheson's adapted script of his short story Prey, a chilling fight for survival against the animated Zuni fetish doll with perhaps the greatest twist ending ever. The other two stories, although forgettable, were scripted by William F. Nolan, co-writer of Logan's Run and screenwriter of The Norlis Tapes, the second remarkable TV movie I want to talk about. Roy Finnis, The Invaders, and Angie Dickinson, Dressed to Kill, were the marquee names of this unsung classic. Finnis played David Norlis, a skeptical, myth-busting reporter who meets the widow of a sculptor. She claims that at night she hears sounds coming from her deceased husband's studio and that a diabolical life-size statue he left unfinished somehow appears close to completion. After supernatural shenanigans ensue and the dust settles, Norlis is nowhere to be seen. Only his recorded cassettes remain, to which this day feels disquieting, even though I know he was set to resurface in the TV show this was the pilot of. The show never occurred. I haven't seen this film since the 80s, and for some reason it's really hard to find on eBay and Amazon at a reasonable price. I really wish some bright young gun like, say, Fade Alvarez would remake it for the big screen. 
By the way, Dan Curtis directed both Trilogy of Terror and the Norlis tapes. God bless him. He also directed my beloved The Winds of War miniseries and War in Remembrance. The last movie I want to mention is Frankenstein, The True Story. In this take, Mary Shelley's reanimated man wasn't a monstrous fiend at all. He was a debonair gentleman taken on a tour of London's high society by his creator until his patchwork body begins to fester and decay. What happens to the lovely Jane Seymour in this movie was one of the biggest shocks of my youth. <laughs> Besides her and Michael Sarazen as the Frankenstein monster, the cast included Albert Whitlock, James Mason, and Dave McCallum. Thankfully, this one is easy to find on Blu-ray. Rob, which of these obscure classics from yesteryear have you seen? Besides Trilogy, do you treasure any of them? And if so, do you own them on Blu-ray? Well, Victor Rosario for Maine, uh, yes, sir, I've seen them all. And let me tell you some other ones I would add to that. Barbara Eden, I Dream of Jeannie, and The Stranger Within, is it The Stranger Within? Yeah, The Stranger Within, where she's been impregnated by some alien ray, Killdozer, based on a Ted Sturgeon story. Uh, Satan School for Girls, Bad Ronald is another one. These are all, by the way, everybody who's going, what are you talking about? These are all TV movies or, or television series from the 70s. There was some great, great horror and science fiction done. for The TV movies in the 70s were awesome. And, and, and I keep forgetting, the name. there's an awesome book that I have. It's over there. I can't grab it because it's too far away. Uh, there's a great book that came out. There's a woman... A friend of mine's wife, actually, who wrote a book, let's see, TV, hang on, T, I'll put it in the thing, TV movies of the 70s, let's see if it'll show up, um, oh, come on, man, hang on, I saw it, maybe, maybe I can, let's see, uh, TV movies of the 70s, Horror TV movies. Uh, shoot, I don't know. Oh, I, you know what? I got. I got I to gotta change my search. Hang on, I'm gonna find this. Now I'm going to find it. Books. Let's see if it'll show up. There it is. Are you? It's by Amanda Reyes, and the book is called "Are You in the House Alone?" A TV movie compendium from 1964 to 1999. Oh, this book. I got this book. I love this book. You, my friend. You, if you don't own this book, you need to get this book. All of the things that you mentioned are in it. I'm putting it in the live chat. I'm putting the Amazon link. I'm not even a, uh, I'm not even a uh, Amazon. What's it called? Associate or whatever. I'm just. It, it's awesome. Plus, Amanda Reyes is cool, and uh, it, this book is great, and it deals with all of those movies. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir, Victor. You and I definitely park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay, one hundred percent. Uh, right there with you. And let's see. Uh, let's see if I have... How many more letters do I have? Henry Swanson sends a letter in. And Henry Swanson... Uh, let me see. Henry Swanson says, Dear Rob, this is my first letter. So hopefully I'm doing this right. Well, that remains to be seen, Henry. We shall see. You're about to be judged by the post-geek singularity. But we're a good bunch, so I wouldn't worry. I'm a fairly new addition to the Observations viewership, having discovered your channel in the midst of my desperate searches for new content during quarantine. I've come to love the show and the open and inclusive community you fostered here with the Post Geek Singularity. So thanks to you and the rest of the PGS for creating a space where I know my thoughts and opinions are respected and understood, even though I haven't mustered the courage to participate myself until now. Well, welcome, sir. I'm writing today to pick your brain on one of my favorite films, which, while semi-frequently referenced on the show, I don't think I've heard your in-depth thoughts on, considering that it bridges my main interests of cinema and music, Ooh. specifically that of late 60s, early 70s. It seemed a fitting topic for my first letter. I'm, of course, referring to what I consider to be Cameron Crowe's masterwork, Almost Famous. For those who haven't seen the film, it tells the story of 15-year-old journalist William Miller, a semi-autobiographical analog for Crow himself, as he tours with the band Stillwater on assignment for Rolling Stone magazine in 1973. I've loved this movie since I first watched it around age 3 or 4, wow, and my fondness for it has only grown as I've gotten older. I am now the same age as William Miller, so I'm more connected to the movie than ever before, and I find myself comparing and contrasting my life experience so far with that of Williams, 
and I would assume, by extension, Cameron Crowe himself. Long before his debut feature in 1989 was Say Anything, Crowe wrote for various rock magazines in San Diego, such as Cream, edited by one Lester Bangs, music journalist and God, portrayed in the film brilliantly by Philip Seymour Hoffman in high school before being tapped by Rolling Stone magazine at age 15 as their youngest contributor. Crowe had interviewed Dylan, Clapton, Bowie, and wrote his first cover story on the road with the Allman Brothers, all by age 16. Crow went on to write Fast Times at Ridgemont High, both the book and the film, before transitioning into his most well-known career as a director. As a wannabe filmmaker and rock music fan, this movie, for lack of a better term, is a total wet dream, and it's only gotten better as my music knowledge has expanded, allowing me to find new little references and in-jokes that make the movie all that much sweeter. I grew up with the DVD and VHS copies of the theatrical cut and only discovered the existence of the extended cut around six years ago. Gaining new understanding as I've aged, along with the extended footage, solidified this film's place in my personal top three favorite films of all time. Though, as I mentioned above, my evaluation of the film has changed somewhat now that I find myself the same age as William Miller. While I feel somewhat unaccomplished compared to the protagonist, I'm no college graduate at 15, nor a contributor to Rolling Stone, I can't help but acknowledge now the major impact this film has had on me, which I hadn't really considered or noticed before. This movie made me believe at ages 3, 7, 10, 12, and now 15 that I could pursue my passions and make my mark despite my age. There are other movies that have done similar to inspire my creativity, but Almost Famous has always been different. It's honest, perhaps not entirely with some of its finer details, but the core of the movie is real. Maybe I didn't consciously realize this when I was enamored of Patrick Fugit and Kate Hudson on our large box of a TV as a toddler, but I think now I recognize that's the reason I truly love this movie. My passions for music, film, and journalism all have their roots in my viewing this film over and over, and Cameron Crowe, through his work and the character of William Miller, is largely to thank about my continued pursuance of these passions. I've rambled on enough about this movie, but I thought this movie deserved it considering its relative obscurity. I enjoy some of Crowe's other films after this, such as Elizabethtown, but after the whole situation surrounding 2015's Aloha, I haven't seen much of Crowe other than a David Crosby doc he produced last year. I wonder if he'll ever return to the directing chair. Anyways, thank you so much for taking the time to read this, and huge thanks to you and the Post Geek Singularity for the awesome show and even better viewer community. Kindest regards, Henry Swanson. P.S. I'm a fan of the Blu-ray currently available, what, but I would absolutely adore a Criterion release or similar by another boutique label containing the theatrical and unrated cuts remastered in 4K and an ass ton of special features. Probably won't happen, but I can dream. Do you prefer the theatrical or untitled cut? Well, Henry, as many people might have might know, I think Almost Famous, the untitled version, the theatrical version is fine, but in my mind, the untitled version is infinitely better. I mean, it's not infinitely better because the first one's good, but I, I don't even watch the theatrical anymore. I adore the movie. It's probably in my top 10 favorite movies of all time. I identify with it on a number of levels because while I never toured with a band when I was younger... I had much older friends that were sort of various friends that would mentor me in certain things. And I, I love the film. I totally identify with William Miller. I love the film so much. I, I, I love everything about the movie. I love all the cast. I, love, I, 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 I could watch that movie like every day if I had to. It's right up there. It's one of my favorite films of all time. Um, and I, you know, I look, it's funny because I obviously when it came out, I was already working in the film business but uh it reminds me of it totally reminds me of my teenage years even though it, it was different but it reminded me of that and i i love the film i just adore it um it's so good it's such a great movie and i can understand i mean i i'm glad you got to see it at a young age but i also don't think look man it's a different place and remember of all the kids in america there was only one cameron crow you know, he was the youngest correspondent for Rolling Stone. He was kind of a savant. He was really, it shows you, you know, if you're really interested in something and you really pursue it. I mean, nowadays, everybody has a voice. Everybody can start a blog. Everybody can, can uh, you know, pursue what they want to pursue. It's a different world. And there, he, there was only one of him. So you never have to feel that you, uh, I don't think you have to feel that you're underachieving at all. Um, you just have to pursue what you want to pursue and pursue it vigorously and don't give up. And nowadays, I mean, look, I watch a, another YouTuber, the Professor of Rock. Uh, 
I watch his YouTube channel all the time, and he reminds me. I, you know, I did some research at first. His delivery bothered me. I thought it was too slick and too written. Like you could tell, he writes this stuff. I thought, was he? Is he an actor playing this character? But then I looked him up, and no, he's not an actor. He really is that guy. And so I've really enjoyed. Uh, the, I, by the way, if you like. The Professor of Rock really does a good job delving into pop music. It's a really great channel, actually. But he reminds me of an older William Miller. <laughs> but uh, definitely, it's it's. I love the film, and you know, I don't think if you're 15 now, you've got the whole you got your whole life ahead of you, and and now more than ever, there's easy ways to make your mark on the world. You know, there's things, there's techniques and technologies that never existed before, and I think uh, despite what's happening now in the world. Dude, just go make it happen for yourself. You're you're on a path. Go make it happen. Don't be discouraged. Just go do it. Um, cause you can. <coughs> this next uh, letter comes from. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, hang on. Comes from Joey Coke. Hey Rob, the power of yesterday's show horror theme topic compels me. <laughs> The power of yesterday's horror theme topic compels me to write my first letter. Not the first time I've written to you, but simply peppering your comments section isn't quite the same level of commitment. Anyway, this past weekend, my lovely grown children bestowed upon me on Father's Day the Blu-ray of The Hills Run Red. Wow. It wasn't a huge surprise. <laughs> I kind of feel guilty about that, actually, but awesome. It wasn't a huge surprise because they'd asked me earlier in the week what I'd like as a gift, and since I tune into Rob's observations daily, it was the first thing that came to mind. Now, even though the intent of this letter is not to review the movie, I will say that it was clever and enjoyable. I really like the overall look of the picture, the aspect ratio, the location, the set design, and the fine photography all come together beautifully for a cinematic look that provides a pretty pine-textured backdrop to the menacing flesh-and-blood grindhouse drama that unfolds. There are some fun, memorable moments that made me chuckle, such as when the character of Lalo tries to defend himself with a couple of flares, Serena's costume change, and the awesome tree-powered victim-splitting sight gag. But my favorite image was when the hills literally ran red and the hand emerges from the slop. Isn't that awesome? Uh, in the documentary I made, uh, the, the original documentary, it shows us shooting that scene. That there was, was there five or seven 50 drum gallons of fake blood, and we had to pour them into the, 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 the pit that was, oh, it was the best. <laughs> it was the best. Uh, been chipping away at the special features and commentary as well. It's always fun and inspiring to see the commitment and thought process of the cast and crew. One last thought I have to convey is that when I compare it to the most recently made slasher film I've seen, Hellfest from 2018, which I looked up to see that it had a $5.5 million budget, I really can get a sense of how Team Hills stretched their dollars to produce a comparably glossy and entertaining product for a fraction of the cost. I appreciate that. Um, so that's just a few thoughts on The Hills Run Red. But really, what I wanted this letter to be was about introducing my children to the horror genre, which occurred around the same period of time in the late 2000s, or which occurred around the same period of the late 2000s, 2007 to be exact. When they were tweens, my daughter being 12 and my son 8, that seems young, but I survived barely seeing Jaws in the theater when it was released, and I was 8 or 9, so it was time. Leading up to the horror event, I had fun curating their entertainment, and in this era, there was quite a few age-appropriate movies, mostly comedies that the whole family enjoyed, such as Napoleon Dynamite, Big Fat Liar, School of Rock, Spy Kids. God damn, it was so cute watching them watch Spy Kids 3D in a theater as they stood up trying to pop some bubbles or something. And of course, Agent Cody Banks. But the Star Wars prequels, Lord of the Rings, the first couple of Nolan Batman flicks were also movies that we enjoyed as a family. So they'd been exposed to darker themes and grotesque images. In the case of the heavier movies, there would be discussions before and after the show, which must have helped because there were no issues of nightmares or anxiety or general fallout from the more mature material. In fact, my daughter says that she remembers us prepping her to see Fellowship of the Ring. She must have been five before we took her to the theater. I also remember being scoffed at by some neighbors with children the same age who were at the same time showing without who at the same time showing without their kids but we still have pages left over from her diary at the time which she wrote I love Frodo over and over. 
The mid-2000s era did produce some of my favorite horror films, such as Cabin Fever, House of a Thousand Corpses, 28 Days Later, The Descent, Shaun of the Dead. So there were some great picks available to share with them back in 2007. I hope you didn't show an eight-year-old House of a Thousand Corpses. <laughs> but God damn it, Rob, I'm no monster. Those aren't appropriate. Oh, good. <laughs> there was an incident in my son's first grade class a few years prior in which one of his classmates watched Texas Chainsaw. <laughs> probably the remake, and told some of the other kids in class about it. This elementary school was a pretty small, tight community, and let's just say you do not want to be the family taking the scorn from the parents and faculty for something like that. But in, 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 but in 2007, there was a film that emerged as a candidate for a horror initiation party, and that was The Messengers. The Messengers had a PG rating, and when it was released in theaters, it was accompanied by a castle-like marketing campaign that teasingly advertised a downloadable ringtone in a frequency audible only to young people, I remember that, a theme that was in alignment with the movie. I was a fan of the Pang Brothers, liking both the I-1 and 2, so upon its DVD release, I rented The Messengers. This event was a big deal for us all, and they were a little apprehensive. Well, about 15 or 20 minutes into the movie, there was a cheap jump scare in which they became completely unglued at. That was it. They tapped out. <laughs> I felt pretty awful. They weren't scarred, but I was still determined. I'm not sure how long it was after this when the second attempt occurred. Weeks, maybe? The new choice was a film released in 2001. It was The Others, and it turned out to be the perfect match. There was a sense of dread throughout, but the ending? Pure catharsis. Denouement. I could see all the anxiety drain from their faces, heart rates normalizing, smiles. They got it. It was beautiful, and I was a proud parent. Rob, I should finish this off by saying that in 2008, with the help of my kids, my wife, and a few friends, I made a short film titled Demonica. <laughs> I love that. Demonica. It was the second short in my self-proclaimed trilogy, but the only one my daughter was involved with, and everyone was so sweet, generous, and patient with me. It was so much fun to do, and it has been an interesting family document to archive and remind me of how lucky I am to have these people in my life. But at the same time, I think I wanted to convert my kids into horror movie fans, which is not what happened. But come my birthday or Christmas or Father's Day, they almost always give me some kind of horror-related stuff. Usually art books, sometimes a t-shirt. Hell, my daughter even gave me a bad motherfucker wallet. <laughs> She's 25 now and living in New York City working in the fashion industry. My son is 21, home for summer break before he begins his last year of collegiate studies in kinesthesiology. I hope this letter finds you okay and the formatting stays intact as I'll be copying and pasting it into your box. Stay rad, Rob. Your fan, Joey Koch. Oh, it's Joey Koch, not Joey Coke. It's the, co the Coke. Joey Coke? Coke? Koch? Coach? Coke? Coke Brothers? Koch? I have, he gave me the link. Demonica. So here's a trailer for Demonica for all of you. Please watch this trailer for Demonica and tell me what you think. I'm going to watch it because I want to say Demonica over and over again in a world where Dem I don't even know what I don't even know what it is. I have to watch the trailer. So, I mean, thanks for that. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. I guess what I got to end today, I got a Ian Samuels double header. Dun dun dun. Rob and fellow observationists, imagine the scene: Halloween night, 2020, Haddonfield. A police car is left stranded. One of its occupants is hanging out of the side window. Their head has been hacked almost completely off, hanging gruesomely by remaining flesh at the front of the neck. His colleague had got out of the car and emptied a clip into the masked assailant. The killer seemed unaffected by bullets as they hammered into his body. The second police officer eyes with their throat, lies with their throat cut in a pool of their own blood next to the police cruiser. Michael Myers has come home. But as Michael enters his childhood home, he has no idea it is under new ownership. A psychologist named Christy Cotton... <laughs> has moved to their area to get away from her own horrors. As Michael enters to distract him, Christy grabs an object from her mantelpiece, a decorative box. She throws it at him and rushes out past him. Michael, having caught the box himself, finds himself fascinated by it. He turns it over and over, studying the intricate carvings. He rubs a thumb on the box, tracing a circle. Suddenly the box moves and opens. Michael drops it to the floor. There's a clap of thunder behind Michael in the doorway appears Pinhead, 
just an example of strange things that go inside my head, go on inside my head. That's Ian Samuels, ladies and gentlemen. That was one of two. Here's another one. Rob and fellow observationists, I love horror. Always have. When I was growing up, I fell in love with hammer horror. I first read Dracula when I was seven. I was an odd child. When I became a teenager, I discovered such films as Halloween, Hellraiser, Rosemary's Baby, The Omen, and of course, The Exorcist. And then I discovered more by horror legend John Carpenter, including the Fantastic Apocalypse trilogy, The Thing, Prince of Darkness, and In the Mouth of Madness. Still one of my favorite films and one of the greatest Lovecraftian style horror ever. But other than such gems as the psychological thriller The Lighthouse, the majority of modern horror films focus little on plot and mostly on jump scares. I don't think I've enjoyed a new horror film since the first Saw. There's some pretty good stuff. Watch The Invitation. Have you seen that? I have it right over there. Uh, but we do have the streaming service Shudder, which has some classics on it. I would like to make another suggestion for horror films. The YouTube channel Demented Pictures. They have some great top tens as well as a series of Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About videos. For example, I watched Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About the Rocky Horror Picture Show and Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About the Evil Dead. The director, I've watched those, the director of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Rick Sharman, placed actual Easter eggs around the set for the cast, crew, and viewers to find. This may have been the origins of Easter eggs on DVDs. In the words of Mike from Demented Pictures, which he says at the end of all of his videos, may your mo may your movies be bloody and may all of your scares be shitless. Ian. Well, Ian, thank you for that. Uh, I did not know. Well, he does say that. I've heard him say that. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings an end to Rob Observations episode number 452. Oh, my God. What a good day today was. What a fun show. I want to thank everybody for the generous support of the channel. I want to thank my moderating staff. I think only the Richard is here, though. Maybe that's why. Uh, I, I hope he didn't have too hard of time. There's, of course, Mike Bodden. There is Greg Smith. There is the Richard. Haynock comes in occasionally. Uh, and Jordy Lyons. We're looking for more moderators. So if you think you have what it takes, well, I'll have more information on that soon. Anyway, um, also, I want to thank... Did I say Mike Bodden? I did say Mike Bodden. I want to thank Richard for running all the watch parties on the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page. He does a lot of... He's curating a lot of really interesting stuff, so there's always something going on. Go over to the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page and also the Whining About Movies Facebook page for Whining About Movies. We're in the middle of Sci-Fi Week. We did AI and Ex Machina last night. We have a two-bottler, a two-bottle of wine show coming up for you tomorrow. Never Let Me Go, Mark Romantic's Never Let Me Go, and Passengers the very controversial science fiction film with J-Lo and uh, J-Law. No, J-Lo. No, that's Jennifer Lawrence. J-Law is Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, Dieter Bastian's screaming at me right now, I, I can tell. And uh, Chris Pratt. So it's a double header. Never Let Me Go. If you've not seen Never Let Me Go, don't, don't read anything about it. Just go watch it. Uh, it's fantastic. Based on the book of the same name. Anyway, I want to thank all of you for your generous support. Please send me letters or videos to the burnetwork.net website. And uh, there's there's thousands of letters up there. We're trying to we're behind, but we're trying to get all the letters that I read in the show up there, which we will. And if I don't read your letter on the show for whatever reason, it'll be up on the website, so it's not all lost. It'll be there. Uh, so yes. Now remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear, and all you have to do is listen and with that i say as always ladies and gentlemen at the end of observations a show about something as always i say have a better day <laughs>